His name is where? Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I think it's that name. Sorry about that, Mike. Well, good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, welcome to our first of two days here in uh, Grand Rapids on behalf of uh, Judge Kelly and Judge Yates. Uh, welcome. I, uh, looking at the docket today, I see we have a number of people, in fact, a couple of repeat arguments by different attorneys who are well familiar with our process, so I'm not going to belabor the point. I'll only note that um, uh, if your case involves minor children, please do not identify them by name, use an initial, or refer to them as child or children. I'd also uh, ask, uh, and I simply remind you, that... Uh, uh, we're very familiar with the facts, and we'd ask you uh, to turn to those few issues that probably your case turns on, on the law, and anything that you don't think was uh, fully developed in your briefing. So with that, I'll just jump right to it. I will call the first case, People of the State of Michigan versus McSwain, 368367. Yeah, all right. Good morning. Good morning. Attorney Roland Lynn for Mr. McSwain. The theme of my uh, comments this morning is, is respect. Uh, first, respect uh, for this court's purpose, its job when reviewing um, statutes and laws, interpreting them. Uh, second, respect for uh, this Michigan, I'm sorry, the US Supreme Court and its Bruin decision. And third, uh, respect for the, um, the decision of another a fellow panel, three panel, that decided the Langston case back in April. So first, um, when this court interprets a statute, a constitution, any appellate court, um, they're certainly paying attention to laws statutes, things that were written, precedent. But overarching all this, and or maybe underlying it all, is the, the rule of logic and reason. We jettison that, then everything else that's done is, is simply gibberish. And a principal rule of logic is the rule of non-contradiction. Something cannot be one thing and then be its opposite simultaneously. And that's, uh, in essence, what the footnote in Bruin is doing, is it's saying it's not history, it's something other than history, yet the holding is history. So before the Langston case came down, you had an interesting possibly successful argument on the Second Amendment question. Then Langston comes down addressing this issue squarely. Are you, how are you asking us to deal with that case, Langston? Are you asking, are you saying your case is different? If it is, it looks identical. Uh, and we're stuck from your perspective following uh, a published case. So what do you, What's your, what's your best argument? Well, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm saying in order to respect the principle of non-contradiction, which is the penultimate mm -hmm. law the court must apply, it has, to, it has to overturn what the other three panel did because they, again, followed all the lower court's decisions and the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, footnote that is contradictory. But even if we agree with you, that's just a recipe for chaos. If we try to work our way around published opinions that are clearly on point. I mean, we, we tried that and we abandoned that approach back three and a half decades ago because it was just unworkable. Panels could do whatever they wanted. 
Well, you're not doing whatever you want. You're, what you're doing is you're applying the, 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 principle, the principles of reason and logic to try to understand and respect what the US Supreme Court did in Bruin. See, unfortunately, they threw us, threw you on the horns of a dilemma, threw us all on the horns of a dilemma. They said, it's history, that's the only standard, but the footnote seems to suggest it's something different or maybe more than suggest, at least that's what all the other courts have been relying on to say this, this law that seems pretty reasonable, this, this, this gun control law, and, and we would, you know, that. But the Supreme Court itself just handed down another case just a couple of weeks ago about domestic abusers. And it said that people were overreading Bruin, that Bruin doesn't mean what people think it means, that it actually, <laughs> History is not the only guide anymore. Judge H, I disagree with what you, how you characterize Rahimi. Rahimi, Rahimi does two, two big things scream out at me about Rahimi. One is that they applied the principle of history test to the domestic violence, that person. And they said, we can find an analogy. We find an analogy in the surety laws. And we find an analogy in this don't go carrying with the purpose of creating violence or mischief or mayhem. Those are the historical analogies, the Bruin test, this passes the Bruin test. Now, the second point I wanna make is the author of Bruin, Justice Thomas, he's sticking to that originalism, Absolutely. super duper religious right. uh, originalism. But he didn't have a lot of, any, a lot of agreement on that. Point. Right, but this court doesn't have to, to, to adopt the, uh, the Originalism on steroids, I, uh, I'm trying to think of the- But if Rahimi had extended Bruin even further, then you might have an argument that we could reopen Langston. If anything, Rahimi cut back on Bruin. And so I come back to Judge Cameron's position that we can't just disregard a published opinion that our own court issued in the last few months. But you're dis but they're, they disregarded it in that they said the footnote, well, you're gonna rely on the footnote, this illogical footnote to ignore the holding. I think to, to um, follow the precedent, you have to apply that holding. Something is going to be ignored in, in, in Bruin. And I don't think that's disrespectful, um, even though, um, it, look, there is, I acknowledge that part of my argument may have a cynical tone. Um, I think they, um, the Mississippi, the federal case, Mississippi, uh, the 77 page uh, argument did it, articulated it much more eloquently than I'm about to do it. But there is probably a little bit of a spirit uh, that you're hearing from me that, well, okay, US Supreme Court, if this is what you want, if you want originalism, this is what you get. All these common sense gun laws are gonna go away. What do you think of them apples? That might be kind of what you're hearing from, from me and maybe to a certain extent, it's a little bit true. But again, um, you don't have to be so cynical to still do the main purpose, which is to uh, apply the law using reason and logic. Otherwise, you're doing what Bruin said don't do. Don't, don't look at ends and means. That's not the test. Common sense isn't necessarily the test. What's the test is history. And there's no historical analogy. Unlike in Rahimi, there was a historical analogy. There's no historical analogy. There were no licensing rules. <clears throat> and there's nothing analogous. I still haven't heard an explanation how we get around Langston. Even if we agree with you, you keep talking about respect and this and that, but we have to respect that as a, as a binding precedent because it's a published case. So are you asking us to call like a conflict panel or I mean, we have rules that we have to follow this, but we can't just willy nilly say that, well, that doesn't follow history. So that's the end of it. Or do you think we can? Well, I, I, just, I, I disagree that that's that saying uh, that's that history has to be the test and therefore our previous decision failed that test or, or is not consistent with the Bruin holding. 
And now we're correcting it. I don't think that's willy nilly. I think that's doing the greater purpose of, of that this panel has. And I recognize that it, um, I don't mean personally uncomfortable, but legally may be uncomfortable because it seems to be contradicting. But the, the, the US Supreme Court is doing that now, I guess, fairly regularly, is, is revisiting things that we thought were settled decades and then some, and, and, and saying, no, we did it wrong. We're gonna correct that. And I'm asking this panel to correct the mistake that the other panel made. Well, you have uh, plenty of time. Uh, how about we hear from the appellee and then you got plenty of time for a rebuttal. All right, thank you. I'm the prosecutor's office on behalf of the people. I'm actually unendorsed today, so I'm just here to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. All right. Well, it's kind of unfair to call that a rebuttal. Not much to rebut there, but uh, <laughs> are you got anything else to say? Um, well, I think I touched on, you know, you're still respecting the three panel, even if you're disagreeing with them for principal purposes. Uh, I guess my, my problem, I'll just leave it at, at okay. this. The issue for me is not whether I agree with, with whether you're right or not or whether your position is right or not. The question is, is that we have a published case that says you're wrong and you've not given me a principled reason to deviate from precedent. Supreme Court can, but I, I and, and it doesn't I, matter whether I agree with you or not. I've got another case that's squarely on point that, that says you're wrong. That's, that's where I'm at. I'm not speaking for them, I'm just speaking for me. Um, I guess my only rejoinder is twofold. One is that I have uh, applied to the Michigan Supreme Court in Langston, and then and also uh, the same day that the this court uh, ruled on Langston, Langston, they also denied an application I had with another Kent County case identical to the ones we're talking about. I have appealed to the Michigan Supreme so applied. I've not. I, they've accepted my filing, but not have ruled. Uh, so they may, but I don't understand the reluctance. If if you were co to come to the principal conclusion that, that that the other panel did it wrong, why the the court's hands would be tied to correct a mistake. Uh, so I, I ask you, please reconsider that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, item number one is submitted. Thank you. Turning now to item number two, people of the state of Michigan versus Robinson. That's item number 367626. All right. Um, I show only one person being endorsed. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. I am just here in case the court has questions. Okay. Go right ahead. Or would you like the defense to put his? Not yet. Why don't you, why don't you kick us off first and then we'll turn it over. Good morning, Your Honors. Katie went with the Kent County Prosecutors on behalf of the people. Um, given that the defense is unendorsed today, I would just primarily rely on my brief unless the court has any questions for me on this. I have a question for you. Why isn't this just a search incident to arrest where you can look inside the passenger compartment without any level of suspicion at all? I they, think arre they arrest him. Once he's arrested, my understanding of the search incident to arrest doctrine is that it only extends to the vehicle if it's in, within the passenger or within the individual's reach um, because of the justifications of the search incident to arrest. Of course, it's officer safety at that point. And if I recall correctly, he had been arrested, he had been handcuffed, and he's back at the car. So I don't know that the justification arises for that anymore. And that's, that's Gant, right? Yes. And then with Gant, you can look for evidence of the crime, which... That this case strikes me as absurd, okay? You, you've got a man who's not intoxicated, right? He rolls through a stop sign, right? They pull him over. They see an open bottle of tequila. He says, I haven't been drinking. Take my, you know, give me a breathalyzer if you want. Am I under arrest? Uh, yeah, but this might check out, mm -hmm. okay? Now, the panel that granted leave in this said one of the issues to address is whether you can search for additional bottles of booze when 
if you found additional bottles of booze, there's no enhancement to the crime. Correct. In other words, you find a rack of cocaine, we, we then find, it goes from you know, possession of this small amount, we find a shoebox full of it, whole different crime. Here, whether there's one bottle of tequila or 10, there, there's no change in the, so what are they searching for? I mean, they already have th this misdemeanor has already been satisfied. They have him, he's arrested. What business do they have searching the vehicle at that point? I understand the question, Your Honor, and I, I would point this court first and foremost to page 13 of my brief, which has all the federal decisions, which has said this does give probable cause to search for additional open alcohol containers. And I think this is a public policy concern at this point. You know, it, it, there's plenty of courts that have said there's probable cause at this point to believe that there may be more in the car. And do we want to let our drivers continue to carry open alcohol if they're already um shown a tendency to disobey the law in that regard, we have an issue with people drunk driving, drinking on the road, and that's the whole reason. Yes. I, I understand, okay? But I'm long enough in the tooth to have read an awful lot of police reports, and I don't accept the proposition, as this cop said, that if there's one open bottle, that means there's more. I mean, says who? If, I, if I were to subpoena the, the, the last 100 police reports from the Grand Rapids Police Department that mentioned an open bottle of tequila in the back seat, you know, how many would say, yeah, and then we found just tons of them, okay? I mean, it, don't we have to parse that, okay? Is, is, the, is the driver intoxicated? That might mean he has more than one open bottle. Is it in the front seat? Is it in the back seat? Is it beer? I mean, normally the beer bottles or the, the cans are empty. That's why he opens up a, a fresh one. So, I mean, I just absolutely reject the proposition that this officer said, and nobody talks on that video about, hey, let's go look for more, more booze. They immediately start to, to rifle through this guy's car. They're looking underneath floor mats. I don't know if you're gonna find an open bottle of booze underneath a floor mat, rummaging through papers. They tear open his pants, they find some cash. I mean, this just very much seems to exceed what's a permissible search in my view. Your Honor, and I would agree that, you know, looking through the AirPod container, looking through the cigarette holder, that that did exceed the search. And if we were in a situation where they found the drugs in that AirPod or in the cigarette, I, I we would have we would have conceded this motion. Um, we would have not laid the case on that basis because that would have been an unlawful search. But when we look to the trial court's findings here, the trial court made the factual finding that this rack of cocaine, I, I believe it was a rack of cocaine, was found on the floorboard of the car in plain view while they were searching for those open alcohol containers. Uh, well, while they were in the lawful place to search for open alcohol containers. So I think that's the key difference with this particular case. If, if we say the automobile exception justified the initial search, it's was this found in a place that the officers were lawfully allowed to be. And on the floorboard in plain view, I would submit to the court is a place that the officers were lawfully allowed to be during the course of this search. Now, with respect to the concerns about was the crime complete at the time that they um, entered the vehicle and did this automobile concert, uh, search? I would point this court to the analogies that I submitted in my brief, in particular, the possession of methamphetamine one. Because when we talk about controlled substances and the defense uh, relies on this in their brief, it's usually you know less than 50 grams, 50 to 450, 450 to 1,000 and above. But as this court knows, with possession of methamphetamine, any amount is uh, sufficient for the same crime. We don't do that the staggered amounts with that crime. So under that logic, if they found methamphetamine on the person during a search incident to arrest, under the logic that the crime is already complete, no more methamphetamine would allow them to increase the charges against him, whether it was one gram or 50 grams, um, they wouldn't be able to get into the it car. It was one gram of felony? Of meth any amount of methamphetamine is felony. And there's yes. an open bottle of... of uh... The keel in the back seat of felony or a misdemeanor? That's a misdemeanor, Your Honor. But as, as I point out in my brief, the U.S. v. Ross changed it from our law used to say it had to be a felony, and now it just has to be contraband, which is any unlawful goods to transport. And under- Where, where did that definition come from? Uh, that came from Black's Law Dictionary. Okay. Yes. And so when we look at 257-624-A, it is unlawful to transport an open bottle of alcohol. Um, so when we go back to the analogy, if this court were to hold that once a crime is complete- that you can no longer have probable cause to search the vehicle, then if someone was found with methamphetamine on their person, and I think that 
I, I would hope this court will accept the proposition that someone with drugs on their person is likely to have more. There's probable cause. I mean, this is, you know, we, we see this all the time with officers where they find drugs on a person and they believe that they have probable cause to search the vehicle under the automobile exception due to its ready mobility, um, the pervasive regulation on the vehicle. Um, you know, we've, the courts have said there's less privacy in a vehicle than there is a home. That would strip their ability to then search the car for more methamphetamine or other drugs if it's methamphetamine on the person, because I think that's the... That, that, that's, that's different. But contraband, when we're talking about illegal drugs, okay, small amounts, I, I just don't see a legally purchased bottle of tequila that has some of it missing. It, it's recapped in the back seat with a man who says, take, you know, breathalyze me, I haven't been drinking, that somehow this is contraband for which you can tear apart his car and, and it just seems to greatly exceed the scope of it to me, but I'm, I sound like a broken record now. I think I've made my point. I understand, what, Your Honor. What happened to the vehicle? It was a rental car, wasn't it? I mean, I presume it was impounded. You can't call somebody up to drive away in a rental car. Correct. I, I don't know. That's a great question, Your Honor. Because and I don't I'm, know look, it because there would be an inventory search. Right, in that. exactly. Yes. And so inevitable discovery Correct. saves it. I mean, I, I just don't understand how this guy arrested in a rental car can call a relative and have a relative come get the rental car. The only alternative is either alternatives, return to the rental car company or just impound the vehicle. And then you've got an inventory search and whatever you see in plain view is just automatically. Don't you have to have a policy for an inventory search? There does have to be a policy. And is there and one for a misdemeanor of an open bottle of tequila for a man who's not been drinking? I don't know GRPD's inventory search off the top yeah. of my head. I think that if if that were this court's consideration, then a remand for additional proofs at an evidentiary hearing with respect to their inventory policy could be um, a proper remedy um, if the court does not agree that this was a proper automobile search. But at this point, our record is not clear enough with respect to the inventory policy, and I can't make that representation to the court today because I just don't know it. Let, off the let top me of take my head. this out of the context of alcohol or drugs. Had this defendant been pulled over for a failing to use turn signal, not an arrestable offense, and admits to the officer that uh, he is driving the car without his with a license, suspended license, okay. a misdemeanor offense for which he is arrested but taken back to the car, so we don't have search incident to arrest. Correct. Could the officer conduct a search of the car? I don't believe so. I believe the law says that there is no evidence of that crime. Okay. That that's a particular. Um, so that's the distinction. It's not correct. simply that it's it's it, the person's been arrested and I can search the car outside a search incident. Correct. And I don't okay. I don't have a case on the top of my head, but I do know that that's how we train our officers. That if it's a crime like DWLS, there is not evidence of the crime or other contraband that they would be looking for. So you don't have probable cause to believe that there would be something else right. in the car without more, without additional facts. Got it. Uh, the, the only other analogy I have for the court is, a, is the, the firearm analogy that I, I put in my brief with respect to if you find a firearm, is there probable cause to believe that there's more firearms or ammunition because the crime of CCW in a vehicle um, would be complete, but for the, the fact of whether or not they have a CPL. I, I didn't put that in my brief. Um, but I, I would point the, the court to those two analogies. Um, with respect to your concerns, Judge Kelly, I would point you to the, the federal decisions that we cite in our brief as support for the proposition that we're advancing to the court, as well as, as instructive or persuasive authority, the unpublished decisions of this court from the past two years um, that we cite in our brief as well. Um, but other than that, if this court doesn't have any we, other questions. I've, I've watched that video several times. Sometimes they're talking a little quick, but would, would you... You've watched it. Correct. Would, yes. would you agree that nobody, none of the officers in that tape make any mention whatsoever about looking for more uh, alcohol in the car? I would agree. I don't yeah. believe that they make mention of what so they're, they're, they're looking not, for. They're not doing the search to look for more bottles of booze. The only time this came up was at the hearing when, when the officer said, if there's, if there's one bottle, that means there's more, a, a proposition that I said a couple of minutes ago that I, I completely reject. I, I, I wouldn't reach the same conclusion respectfully as, as your honor with respect to what they're looking for because I don't believe that they state in the video what they're looking for. And then we do have the testimony from the officer, which I understand that your honor um, find, takes issue with. Um, but, but for the panel's consideration, I do know that generally this is a de novo review, but the, 
factual findings of our trial court are reviewed for uh, clear error. And so we have to defer to the credibility determina determinations of the trial court. Um, and in this case, I believe that the trial court found the officer to be credible in his testimony. So um, that's what I would say to, to that consideration. Um, however, I, I recognize the point that your honor is making. Any further questions? No, I don't think so. Thank Looks you. Like you picked the right one to make argument on. <laughs> Please. Uh, your parents, please. Yes, thank you, Your Honors. John Zevelking on behalf of Mr. Dante Robinson. Okay, I see you're not endorsed. Is that I correct? I'm not endorsed. Okay, do, yes. Do either of you have any questions? Yeah. Any comments on the last? A couple of things. One is that uh, we don't have any fact that shows that the vehicle was towed or impounded. And so the inevitable discovery doctrine does not apply on that basis. Uh, secondly, that there has to be some limit on this. The officers here were not searching for additional alcohol. They believed that they had probable cause. They believed that they had probable cause to search the entire vehicle once they saw that open bottle of Patron in the but vehicle. What, what yeah. should they have done with the vehicle? I don't know. We don't have a fact. I mean, were they just supposed to walk away and leave it? Uh, I don't car know, park? We have no fact on that. Okay. I have well, no the, idea. The officer himself said, if this checks out, then this okay. will just be a ticket. Yeah, yeah. So if they didn't do an improper search they would have given him a ticket and away he would have gone right they believe that and when i asked officer sean dewent at the motion hearing if he had any reason to believe there would be open alcohol underneath the floor mat he said yes because there are sometimes hidden compartments under the floor mats in other words there's no end to this scope if you say hey there is a scope it's under ross it's that the object of the search now first of all one open Patron bottle does not give, it's sitting there in the back seat. It's in plain view. And There's so the likelihood of an open shooter or some other thing being open in that vehicle that he's trying to hide is absurd, first of all, because it's sitting right there in the back seat. I mean, if this was prohibition or something, maybe you know, yeah, they'd have they, contraband in the- And maybe they the would have like, compartments underneath formats. Right. I don't know, but not here in this case. The scope has to be, and then it's a reasonable scope and these officers believed that they had, so just limiting, this case is necessary to limit what officers believe they can do. But it, let me ask you this, because I, I think the trial court's finding was that the drug was found in plain view, right? Yes. So if they'd used their flashlight and they covered the front of the vehicle, passenger compartment first, and they found the drug first, they would have been able to seize it in plain view before they saw the Patron bottle, right? That's true. So if they were just looking, so, in the vehicle, so the only the problem you're here, saying they're looking through the glass, they're looking through the windows. Right. So the, the only problem here is sequencing then, because sequencing the, the, the drugs were in plain view. The open bottle was in plain view. They happened to see the open bottle first. Could they have gone back to the vehicle and just used their flashlights to look in the window to see if there was something on the floor? I don't know if you viewed the video, Your Honor, but yeah, this was yeah. not in plain view. Uh, apparently, it, lo it looks to me like it's somewhere like got trapped in the door. Yeah. It's like right on that uh, side. Right. Well, the officer uh, himself said that he might have knocked it off the seat when he was rummaging through the donut yeah. box and the right. papers on the front Yeah, seat. so we don't even know it's on the, the, how that got there. Tell you the truth, it's, it's on, the running spot. Board, on the running board. Yes. Which could not have been seen with a flashlight. It's no, all, exactly. If you're he just got looking without open, you have to open the door, he gets down on his hands and knees. And, and my uh, argument here, Your Honor, is that once they start rummaging through everything, the validity of that search within the scope of looking for alcohol is over. And they had done that already by the time that this officer who had been there for two minutes now is finding something in plain view. So I don't believe that plain view applies here because they exceeded the scope of the search by a mile well, and there right, needs right, to be I, a limit. Right. I agree with you that in order for plain view to apply, the officer has to be in a place where the officer can lawfully be. Right. And so your position is, that it wasn't in plain view unless they opened the door. Yes, and then, I, I, again, we don't even know how it got there, but after a minute and a half of the officer searching, sure. right there, and searching for things that couldn't possibly contain an alcohol container, and then overall reasonableness. You have one individual in a car, you have one bottle in the back, it's a big bottle, it's just sitting there. So even to search for more tiny containers is absurd, and it gives license to the police. My, my problem is, the officers believed, they clearly believed that once they saw that open container, they had right to search that vehicle through and through. 
And once they ripped so. open the pants and found the cash, then the, the search became yeah. a lot more in, in yeah, intense. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Your Honors? I don't see any. No, right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. You bet. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, that matter is submitted. Now turning to item number three, people, State of Michigan versus Richie Morris, Jr. That's 365040. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, Ronald Ambrose appearing on behalf of Mr. Archie Morris. Uh, in this case, I, we raised uh, three issues. Issues number two and three are pretty much aspirational. Uh, there's going to be need a, some change in the law in this area, but I'm hoping that the court will uh, take a look at those issues and, and provide some uh, maybe... Uh, so you're recognizing we're bound by precedent? Yes, uh, I am. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, Refreshing. I, I, yeah. There, you know, people versus Vaughn has always, and this is issue number two, uh, has always been used as a way to say that inconsistent verdicts are allowed in jury uh, trials. But, you know, when you look at the facts of Vaughn, it really <laughs> wasn't necessarily an inconsistent verdict. He was uh, a acquitted of felony firearm, but convicted of felonious assault. And he, he testified at the trial that he didn't have a gun and, and apparently the jury believed it. But then, but it's from that point on that, you know, the appellate decisions always fall back on, <coughs> on Vaughn and pretty much say that inconsistent verdicts are allowed by a jury because of leniency, leniency and, but not allowed by uh, a judge deciding the facts. Issue number three is with regard to double jeopardy. I was hoping that uh, People versus uh, Monroe uh, would be decided by the Michigan Supreme Court. Um, it was not, they denied leave on that case. That is right on point. There are a number of um, Michigan Supreme Court cases right now that are being held in advance. Uh, to determine uh, double jeopardy issue, but they're not directly on point of, of felony firearm and felon in possession that I'm aware of, at least. Um, the first issue, though, is is um, very important. Uh, you know, prosecution says I, I'm misconstruing the use immunity versus transactional immunity, and I'm not. You know, he he provides a proffer in this case. And he identifies himself as the person who was the shooter. Prior to that, it was Ruffin. Ruffin was in jail. Ruffin was being charged with the offense. And when he, when my client goes in for the proffer agreement, he says, "No, you know, I'm the one. I, I'm the one that was in the back seat. I'm the one that that fired these shots." So there was there was no violation of the of the proffer, and even the the judge he denied the motion to quash but found that my client did not lie he just remanded it back down but i it's our position that he should have just quash the information finding that there was no uh, lie in this case that would violate the profit so that's my case in a nutshell and in terms of should have because I agree with you in terms of motions to quash, more than nine out of 10 are dismissed as opposed to remand as a matter of practice. Uh, in this case, it was a remand. You recognize that that was, the court had in a typical case, discretion to do that, remand, not dismiss. But you're saying the particular facts of this case, because of the nature of the immunity, it should have just been dismissed. I am saying that not yeah. the lack of a not the lack of discretion for a remand that it should have been dismissed okay. because there was I mean he he found that my client didn't lie. All right, thank you. All right. Good morning, Your Honors. Amanda Ingram of the Kent County Prosecutor's Office on behalf of Plaintiff Appley, the people of the state of Michigan. Um, I just one note, um, I would reiterate under Hawkins that even though, you know, as 
Judge Cameron, you said nine times out of 10, usually a quash includes the information instead of the bind over. In this case, he did get the benefit of his bargain. He got the quashing of that bind over, but I think there was something lacking. And I mean, this was, these orders were not the model of clarity. Even Judge Faber back in the district court said, I'm not exactly sure what we're supposed to do here. Um, but they put additional testimony on the record as in another case where you might say, eh, this wasn't good. Let's just remand for the sake of judicial efficiency, economy, you know, let's just do that. And that's what happened here. A judge did not abuse his discretion by failing to quash the information altogether, even with the immunity. All right. Any questions? No. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Ambrose, anything further? I do not. Okay, thank you both very much. Uh, item number three is submitted. Turning now to item number four, people of the state of Michigan versus Curry. That's 363742. Michael Morning. Corona on behalf of Mr. Curry. Um, you're stuck with me for the next three cases. I noticed that, yeah. <laughs> I think the practical effect of that is I'll probably pay closer attention to my notes than I normally do. I'm not as good as uh, some other attorneys. So if I, if I don't make much eye contact, please hold that against me, not uh, my clients. Of course, and, uh, not, not a problem. Oh, so um, I'd, regarding Mr. Curry, I'd focus on the first issue. Um, just to get right to the heart of it, I think the disagreement between myself and uh, sister counsel, who I you know, greatly respect, um, uh, had many cases with her. Um, she is focused on the testimony of Ms. McCann, uh, Polo. Um, but uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I'm, I don't think my brief focuses on that testimony regarding uh, this testimony about Mr. Curry being a drug dealer. I think the testimony we should be looking at is from Detective Aikila. So, you know, yeah, true. Ms. Polo didn't say very much about the subject. She was a hostile witness. She didn't really want to be there. She didn't answer questions, et cetera. But uh, Detective Aikila told the jury that, you know, as an expert in phone analysis, that he has had, quote, many encounters with people involved in the drug trade locally, close quote, and that it's not unusual for them to have many phones. And the jury had already been told that Mr. Curry had many phones. And so, you know, mission was accomplished at that point for the prosecutor. They were told Mr. Curry is a drug dealer. And if you're a juror, um, average member of the public, uh, is gonna associate that rightly, maybe wrongly, whatever, with uh, guns, shootings, violence, so, you know, then you have to ask, why, why was that necessary? Why was it necessary to convey that Mr. Curry was a, a drug dealer? There was no evidence that the shooting was drug related. And the prosecution, and also Ms. Cant did tell the jury that Mr. Curry was in the hospital that morning to visit her. So, because the prosecution argues, well, it was necessary, and they argue this from the trial court, it was necessary to connect Mr. Curry and Ms. McCann and Mr. Sturdivant. But that was already done through Ms. Ms. Can. Well, maybe not with Mr. Sturdivant, but they said that was necessary to make that connection for a motive. So that was the idea. Mr. Curry knew Can was shot, and that was his motive to go out and shoot Mr. Sturdivant. Well, I don't know if that's a good argument or not. I, I, I don't think they ever, this was, came out at trial, connected um, uh, Mr. Curry to Sturdivant. There was no, they didn't really connect Mr. Curry to the co-defendant. There was no phone contact, this sort of thing. But if, the, if that was their you know, theory of a motive, that was done through Ms. Cant. She said, Mr. Curry was in the hospital this morning visiting me. He knew, he knew I was shot. And Mr. Curry testified he was in the hospital visiting Ms. Cant. So I think I keep coming back to the question, why was it necessary to put in front of the jury that Mr. Curry was a drug dealer? Um, they argue it was to show Curry was biased against Sturdivant. How? I don't think it, it even accomplished that. They argue, um, I think I already covered that this, this relationship, I don't, it didn't. To show that uh, Mr. Curry or imply or let the jury infer that Mr. Cur Mr. Curry was a drug dealer really didn't show any connection to Mr. Sturdivant. So I think that's, uh, that's the, the first issue. And uh, as the court knows, woven in strictly into the fabric of our jurisprudence is we're supposed to try cases and not people. Uh, this was a 404B issue. It was classic. He's a bad person. He's a drug dealer. Therefore, he did this shooting. And probably the real issue is whether it mattered, whether the harm, whether it was harmless error. I think it was error. Was it harmless error? And uh, it wasn't harmless error because the prosecution's case was not overwhelming. Um, the surveillance video, I didn't go back. I didn't go back and look at it. I have to admit, but I, from my memory, it didn't really capture, uh, you know, what happened. 
Uh, Mr. Curry was arrested without incident. He claimed he was at St. Mary's Hospital. The phone evidence doesn't really tell us anything. Uh, the phones, all right, the phone didn't ping off the hospital, but we all know uh, that how this how they work. They they if they, if, they, if the tower is busy, it bounces to the next tower and right on down the line. I would think a hospital's tower is probably on average pretty busy. So I don't think anybody's claiming that. In fact, I don't think the uh, detective at trial claimed that proved he wasn't at the hospital. He just, all he really said is we don't have any evidence whether he was there or not. Um, Eric Alexander never identified Mr. Curry. And it, ultimately, the prosecution's case turns on Mr. Sturdivant, who did identify Mr. Curry as the shooter. And uh, probably, um, you know, the audience maybe wonder how could Mr. Sturdivant have done that if this is a murder appeal. He, he ends up dying later for unrelated reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Sturdivant, I don't like to speak ill of the dead, but in fairness, Mr. Sturdivant admitted that he uh, met those two people. He knew what they were up to. He said that their intent was to ride up on somebody, get revenge. And I understand Mr. Sturdivant is saying he was, he was okay with that. He, and then they surprised him by shooting him. So there's that. And then, you know, if you stop and think about it, if, 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 if Mr. Curry was not the shooter, then Mr. Sturdivant does have a motive to pin it on somebody else because this person who did shoot him tried to kill him at one point. So I'm not saying, I'm not asking this judge, this court to sit as the, you know, trial and make an evaluation of all that credibility. What I'm saying, all I'm saying is it's not a case of overwhelming evidence. Um, uh, the harmless error rule therefore shouldn't apply. And uh, Mr. Curry should get a new trial because it was completely unnecessary to go into this. Ask the jury to infer that he was a drug dealer. Uh, the prosecution argues the jury was instructed on how to use the evidence. True, but that's irrelevant when the evidence was inadmissible to begin with. Um, this court is held before. The mention of inadmissible evidence may be enough to require a new trial even where the jury is instructed to disregard it. This jury wasn't instructed to disregard this, the evidence or reference to Mr. Curry being a drug dealer. It was told to it could consider it. So that's issue number one. Issue number two, uh, it's unusual. Unless the court has questions about issue number one. Issue two, uh, um, it's an unusual scenario where, where uh, um, the defendant has two attorneys and um, you know could be a scenario where, where uh, too many chefs ruin the broth. Is this be trial issue? No, this is the uh, You're talking about the plea offer. Right? You know, exactly. Uh, um, uh, I don't want to use. Well, um, what I'll say about it is. But I mean, the problem you have there is the trial court made a fact finding and the fact finding is based on the testimony of both of the attorneys, both the lead attorney and the secondary attorney, however you want to describe it. I mean, there's no doubt your client said what he said, but they both contradicted him. And the trial court said he didn't believe your client. He believed the right. two lawyers. Right. Well, it is true that the, the lead attorney, um, you know, I did expect his testimony. I think I may have even said this. I did expect his testimony to be a little more uh, um, uh, forceful, helpful than it was. He didn't want to be there. I mean, we wouldn't be, have been there if he didn't, uh, if I didn't. I mean, obviously, I spoke with him before the evidentiary hearing, and I had, you know, so that's why we were there. And but and, and it's true at the hearing, he wasn't as now he what he what, but at the same time, he did he. Uh, um, he didn't want to be there testifying against another attorney. Sure. And I understand that. I mean, get through here is the least favorite part of the job, you know, for me personally. Sure. But he was there, he testified. And what does he say? Ultimately, he says, I don't know what was said in that room. And that's true. He can't claim he wasn't in the room. But you do have uh, uh, the testimony, as I understand it, was, I mean, no one disputes. An offer was conveyed before trial. That's on the record. Mr. Curry rejected it on the record. Um, um, what happened before that? It was conveyed out in a hallway to the lead attorney and um, his impression at that time, I think he does testify this clearly, was that Mr. Curry was going to take the offer. And then Mr. Curry goes into the room with the, I guess, junior attorney who, who everybody agreed, all three, that Mr. Curry had a stronger relationship with that attorney. He knew him, he represented him in previous cases, he trusted him more. That's why he, I guess he hired that attorney to oversee the trial attorney. It's very strange. And uh, I, I know, <laughs> the, I know the, uh, the uh, lead attorney wasn't happy about it. In fact, this is a, this quote. He said that Curry trusted the junior attorney more than the lead attorney. He said, it, quoted, it was almost offensive to me. 
So that's the dynamic. And, and so Mr. Curry goes into that room with the junior attorney and um, comes out, has changed his mind. And so is that enough under Laffler? Uh, I think it is because then uh, Mr. Curry in his testimony says, uh, you know, he's the, he's the only one that gives an explanation of what happened in that room. Right, right. But the trial court made a finding of fact. Don't, isn't that subject to review only for clear error? Um, I mean, I don't know well, how we declare something sure. clearly erroneous when there's strong testimony to support right. it. I, I, I would say I'm not actually not asking the court to, this court, to overturn a factual finding. I'm asking the court to, I think what is a legal question is, you know, based on those those findings, based on the facts, legally, does that satisfy Lafler? I'm not actually asking the court to make a finding that I don't think I am. I, maybe there's a specific finding I'm, I'm overlooking. But I don't think I'm asking the court to make a uh, a ruling that uh, the trial judge made an incorrect factual finding. I don't think we're actually in disagreement over what the facts are. I think the facts are basically how I've explained them, and I'd be surprised. Um, I don't think the prosecution, you know, disagrees with that. I think I don't. I don't think there's a real disagreement or factually what happened, other than, um, you know, did the junior attorney say something? Did the junior attorney uh, tell uh, Mr. Curry you should go to trial? Um, uh, but I, I don't. I don't. You know, is that a factual finding made by the trial judge? Um, How is it not? Um, I mean, it all comes down to that. It, he says he told me one thing. The lawyer says oh, I never said oh, it. The oh. judge makes a determination who to believe. That sounds like a classic factual finding. If, if so, if then I guess I would be asking this court to overturn the factual finding of the, the trial judge. I would. And the reason would be... Um, uh, the junior attorney, he was asked, you know, more than once, what was said in that room? I don't know. He said he doesn't have any memory of it. Mr. Curry did have a memory of it. And so uh, that would be my argument that, yeah, I guess if, if that's you know, valid, or valid, then I would ask the court to overturn that factual finding of the uh, trial court. Regarding the, uh, unless there's any questions on issue two, regarding uh, the uh, issue three, um, uh, actually, that's an issue. The um, speedy trial issue is one. Actually, issue three is OV6. I'll just stand in my brief regarding OV6. I think there is a speedy trial issue somewhere, and that's issue four. That's one where actually the trial judge made uh, some, fa some findings which favored the defense. He actually found that some of the Barker v. Wingo factors went in favor of the defense, but I'd have to concede ultimately the way the law is developed. Um, I think after this brief is filed, hasn't been favorable. For the yeah, defense. there's almost like there's a COVID exception to Barker versus Wayne. Yeah, pretty much. And I've argued against it in a number of briefs and uh, now with it, now with any success. Um, um, yeah, I disagree with it. Um, I, I don't think there is a COVID, it should be a COVID exception to uh, constitutional rights. Um, but uh, I think this, it's this lost. issue is aspirational. Or, yes, exactly. It's, 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 it's aspirational. And number five is also aspirational. That's an issue that uh, Mr. Uh, um, Curry felt really strongly about, and it's it's a valid issue. Everything I wrote in, under issue five, I sincere, I believe in it, uh, but uh, we have to lose on it, you know, under existing law. That's all I have. Okay. I don't see any questions. Thank you. Good morning again, Your Honors. Amanda Ingram of the Kent County Prosecutor's Office on behalf of the Plaintiff Appellee, the people of the state of Michigan. Good morning. I, I just note that it seemed like most of the argument was focused in on the, the issue on issue the drug. One. Yeah, issue one. You can spend your time however you like, but it seems like you should spend most of your time on that issue. I agree, Your Honor. Um, in response, uh, I did focus my my briefing on Janae McCann, but in all, it's all to do because it's 404B, not of a witness, but of a defense of the defendant. It does go back to defendant. Um, it was, you know, there was testimony that said that Sturdivant himself was struggling with drug use. That's on page 10 of my brief, his, his former girlfriend. Well, what fact and issue does drug use make more or less likely? It's his connection with Ms. McCann. Um, because without knowing that, you know, it's how does this man know uh, the defendant and, and can, how, wh where's this connection? It's, it goes to that motive and the identity that, oh, drug use connected them. So with knowing that he was a drug dealer or a drug user, often buying, we start to see that 
okay, now it's making sense. And it is relevant on that. And it makes it more probable than not. That I thought the theory of the case here was really just straight up revenge. It wasn't settling a drug debt or something like that. With, I mean, we know that the jury is going to be thirsty for facts too. And knowing, well, what for? You know, yes, she was shot, but why are they saying that he did it? You know, I guess is what, it's that last piece of the puzzle. I mean, granted, it's it's a piece, but it is a large puzzle that helps clarify that whole picture. Yeah, that, that would make some sense about why it would matter that she had been a drug dealer or that mm -hmm. Sturdivant was a drug user. But I mean, <laughs> that's not who we're talking about. We're not talking about either one of those people being involved in drugs. Uh, we're talking but, about the defendant being involved in drugs. And it sure seems like the reason that he went out and shot Sturdivant had nothing to do with drugs. It had to do with the fact that he had shot the person who was related but he to him. thought he thought right, right, yeah right, there's right. that relation as well so we have this weird what this triangle web but it is when it comes down to it under Vandervliet, it's for that proper purpose of showing you know that whole you know why why would they shoot why would they just we're left without knowing why and the jury is going to inevitably ask this he shows his motive it shows the identity it is relevant to show that more likely than not defendant acted because, you know, because there was a drug deal gone bad or who it's knows a really what. attenuated way it to is. try to prove something when the most direct way is to say the woman in the hospital was shot. Mm -hmm. The defendant was related to her. He went out and shot the guy that he thought shot her. It could be a little editorializing, but again, it's just that piece of the picture that makes it clearer. Yeah, one last piece. Um, regardless, the probative value of it, you know, she adamantly denied, denied it. We already knew that Sturdivant was a drug user. So, okay, well, whatever. She denied that it's so really, honestly, it ended up being a very small piece of that puzzle. And in the end, did not substantially outweigh or was not substantially outweighed by the undue by undue prejudice, by the chance of it. Um, the retribution, again, bias. We know sometimes that, you know, yeah, if he shot him, again, we want to know what's the connection? Why would he shoot her? How does he know her? Why did they think he knew her? It, it's just that last little connector piece. Are there any other questions on issue one? I just want to briefly mention issue two. I did have an issue statement, Goof. Um, please invert. We definitely believe that there was no error and we definitely do uh, disagree on the facts in here, but I would rest on my brief for those. Any other questions? No? All right, thank, thank you. you. Just simply emphasize that I think the testimony about drug dealing was just devastating to a fair trial under MRE 403. Drug dealing, everybody on the jury knows what that means. Guns, violence, shooting, killing, and, and it was all unnecessary because they already had the connection to the hub of all this, allegedly, according, you know, according to their theory, Ms. Camp. So uh, I asked for a new trial on, on issue one. Other than that, uh, unless the court has questions. Oh, we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, matter is submitted. Turning now to item number five, People State of Michigan versus Shaw. Well, uh, again, Michael Michael Frohn on behalf of Mr. Shaw. One second. Three six three nine nine nine. Go right ahead. Um, actually, the trial counsel in this case was the trial attorney in the previous case. We don't have any uh, ineffective assistance claims. Strictly uh, sufficiency of the evidence claim. It's. Um, um, that's our argument that uh, the prosecution didn't prove malice and didn't prove that Mr. Uh, Shaw was there to commit the predicate felony in armed robbery. Um, it's an unusual case where you have the, uh, the victim. Uh, he was shot. He was killed. Uh, firing back. And then uh, the testimony was that Mr. Shaw, I guess, tried to return fire and accidentally shot his co-defendant. So uh, there's that. And with the letters and different things, to me, the expression I admit he was Expression comedy of errors. I mean, I didn't mean anything offensive by it. I don't know if the prosecution, the court takes offense by that. But that's the expression that came to my mind. You know, it's probably not something uh, 
uh, Moliere would have written and put on a stage, but to me, it was a comedy of errors. Well, and, explain that theory to me, because I think what you're saying is that we know the victim fired a shot of right. some kind. Right. We apparently know that your client fired a shot of some kind, but he hit his confederate. And so under your theory of the case, the Confederate's the one who fired the shot that right. killed. Right. But but there's no doubt that your client and the guy you claim fired the fatal shot were acting in concert, right? I mean, they, they, they weren't just coincidentally there and everybody started shooting at everybody. Seriously, trial. I mean, I understood the defense to be saying uh, that he was there and acting in self-defense. But I have to admit, um, the ski masks. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but that's Wait, that, 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 that an odd coincidence that he showed up in a ski mask, a ski mask. and then he had to act in self-defense. Two know, ski masks. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. a difficult it was a difficult trial to I had trouble following the argument. And you know, I admit, I admit that, you know, and and uh does that ineffective assistance or is that an attorney who's who's frankly uh you're trying to create a reasonable doubt. I mean, I, I read it the I read that side read it the latter. I mean, he's trying. But the point I want to bring you back around yeah. to is yeah. assuming they were trying to steal this backpack with the laptops in it, everybody's on the hook for felony murder, right? Uh, if they were, uh, well, uh, if, if they were there to, uh, yes, if they were there to commit an armed robbery, that's a pretty good felony. And, um, you know, the malice, malice is not, a, you know, it's a high burden, but it is, and Robinson, I don't know if I acknowledge Robinson in my brief, I should have, I didn't. It's not a, you know, under Robinson, they, they, they uh, I'd have, to, I'd have real trouble. But um, I mean, I mean, but, but they both had guns. They did. They did. Here, here, here's. I think this might answer the court's. This is. I mean, this it's, is it's not like your guy was just a bystander who happened to be there. Well, uh, no, no, no. I mean, if they both had guns, they both had ski masks. I mean, right. I mean, that was a testimony, and the jury's free to believe that. Whatever. The, I wasn't there. In fact, there, there's video. Actually, actually, there's video of it. I forgot about <laughs> right. I mean, inside the hotel and outside. I understand that. Yeah, I, I understand that's a difficult case for you know. But <laughs> what I'm saying is, here's here's the argument. I think I think this will be responsive. And oh, uh, you know, because I, I want to be clear. I don't want to sound like so. Here's the argument. The argument is this: um, the the victims. I apologize. I've forgotten his name. Mr. William. Williams. Yeah, Mr. Williams. Um, his girlfriend is out, out there and witnesses this, and, and she's talking to him before the shooting. And she uh, is quoting Mr. Williams, and she told the jury, you know, it's all on the record, that Mr. Williams had trouble with people in the community. And so, um, um, you know, that's the argument is, um, were these two guys there to commit an armed robbery? Or uh, there's not really, you know, of a laptop, I mean, that's you know questionable. Or were they there to uh, harass Mr. Williams? And if if uh, that's that's the issue, did they really prove? Did they really prove that this was an armed robbery? That this was a, what they went through with the intent to put an armed robbery? I mean, after all, after all, the way that it was described was um, uh, they could have shot Mr. Williams right out of the gate if they were there to kill him. Um, there's some kind of conflict. There's some kind of struggle back and forth. You know, th these are these are facts. These are in the record. And, you know, I know I've got an uphill battle. I know I have an uphill battle. There's a lot of evidence here. I mean, after the shooting, you know, there's no doubt he's involved in shooting. He's he's I can't. I'm not, I mean, I mean, that's a difficult argument for the jury. I'm not going to be able to convince. I'm not going to argue this court. He was involved in the shooting. There's video. He's with his co-defendant. Co-defendant gets, gets stitched up. <laughs> It's just a lot of stuff. There's blood in defendant's girlfriend's car, you know, all kinds of evidence. But did they really prove that the motive here was armed robbery beyond reasonable doubt? So that's the that's our argument. And I submit that they they really didn't. They, they didn't prove that the motive was armed robbery. Therefore, they didn't prove the predicate felony. By the way, um, I forgot to say you should have in front of you an amended brief dated February 27, 2024. Uh, I don't even want to draw attention to my first brief. I had some really boneheaded mistakes in there. So, so this is the comedy of errors continues, but we did correct it. And um, that's, that's the argument that they didn't actually prove the predicate felony, that that was, a, that was the intent and, and that they didn't prove malice that they didn't. Uh, although that's a tougher argument because of uh, some of the case law. That's all we got. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farr. 
Good morning, Your Honors. Katie morning. went with the Kent County Prosecutor's Office on behalf of the people. Um, I believe this was very fully briefed and um, with respect to the sufficiency argument, so I will take any questions that the court may have on the issue. But... No, no. Nope. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right, that matter is submitted. Turning now to item number six, people of the state of Michigan versus Bosworth, 364635. Good morning, Your Honors. Michael Frohn on behalf of Mr. Bosworth. Um, and I think this is an interesting case. My remarks will be uh, probably focused on issue one. Um, the prosecution's case here turned on whether the jury believed Keyes III when he told them that Mr. Bosworth participated in the shooting. Keyes III said he was there. Bosworth was with me. We, uh, we shot the victim. But Keyes III was a very problematic witness. I mean, really uh, unbelievable, very erratic. He contradicted himself. He, he, he said that about Mr. Bos Bosworth that he recanted, he went back and forth. He was all over the place. And so, and so the claim that, that Bosworth threatened Keyes III was extremely important because it was offered, that, that the prosecution offered that to explain why Keyes III is such a terrible witness for them. I mean, if it weren't for uh, that, that testimony about threats, um, I believe this, this case would have come out differently. I mean, there's, there's no, no jury is going to be, they needed some explanation for why this, why we should believe this guy, why he's just terrible. Um, and so the threat testimony came in over multiple objections. I mean, this, this issue is clearly preserved. Trial counsel, I, I counted, objected three different, three times. And, all right. And he's overruled. And the state focused on the threat testimony in their closing. They, of course they would. They had to, that, that was their explanation for why the jury should believe Mr. Keyes, the third, as opposed to Keyes, you know, senior. Uh, threat testimony falls under 404B. I don't think anyone, well, uh, that's people v. Thompson. I was about to say, I don't think anyone disputes that, but maybe maybe that is a dispute in this, in this appeal. Um, if so, I'd point out that uh, I haven't, didn't find a lot of cases on this subject, but people v. Railer, 288 Mishap 213, which is a 2010 case, also seems to state that threat evidence falls under 404B, and that's 2010. Um, regarding B2, the uh, but notice- threat, threat testimony is also just admissible as consciousness of guilt, right? Uh, no, uh, I would argue that, that yes, uh, that could be the theory of relevance, but uh, my argument is it's a pro it falls under 404B, period. It falls under 404B. Um, yes, it comes in conscious of guilt. Certainly, right. it okay. can come in for the reasons the prosecution offered it. This case, we're not actually arguing that the that this testimony was irrelevant. We're not arguing that. Sure, I understand. Tr tr arguments focused on the notice requirement. Right. right. That was that was the focus of uh, trial counsel's right. objections. Um, it, now, the argument on appeal from the prosecution is that 404B doesn't apply because these were words and not an act. Well, wait. Um, if we look at 404B, I'll quote it, quote, it applies to, quote, evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or acts. So they're reading the word wrongs out of the, uh, out of the rule. Uh, it doesn't just apply to acts. Well, this could be witness intimidation, which would be a crime. Right, exactly. You're, you're, you're one step ahead of me. I was also going to argue eventually that we actually are not agreeing this isn't an act. You know, if, if the threat was conveyed, uh, we don't really know through a third party, through a letter. That's an act. So uh, exactly. I mean, so 404B applies under the plain language of, uh, of 404B. Is there authority? So I don't know if you even need to argue this, but is there authority for the distinction between words and acts? If, if this court, maybe I don't need to argue this, but if this court were to uh, find um, uh, merit in the argument, these were words, not acts, well, I would argue there isn't. Um, well, but, but let me ask you this. Let's say the timely notice was given. Would you be making this argument that this evidence is inadmissible under 404B? Uh, well, no. And no. Okay. Sure. So so notice is really the beginning and the end of your argument. I think so. Okay. I think so. I can't argue it wasn't relevant. Um, um, I don't believe I would. Um, it, regardless, trial counsel didn't make that argument. It's not preserved, I guess, in some sense. So the, the question is in terms of uh, in terms of notice, and the lack of notice by the prosecution at trial. It is. is why, you know, that's not, that, that doesn't get you where you need to be 
in terms of uh, whether it's harmless or not. So why why did the the lack of notice in this case make a difference? Yes. Uh, well, actually, again, I think uh, trial counsel he did make a good. I have to give, give him credit. He made a good record on it. He uh, argued to the court. I have no idea who threatened him, how he was threatened, how that was communicated. I can't. He actually, and it's true. He actually said, I can't even ask those questions because I don't know the answers. They could blow up on me. Well, he argues the court, I have no way to gather evidence to impeach this testimony because I have no idea what he's going to say. It's an exact quote. But he, he didn't really have to impeach the testimony because he's impeached himself. I mean, the next day he comes back and says, oh, I no. didn't threaten him. Well, uh, but, I mean, the, what, but, what but better the, impeachment could you have than a direct recantation? Well, uh, I think the prosecutor disagree with you because because the prosecutor's argument was, yeah, he's saying that, but that's because he's been threatened. That's because he's been threatened. And so it's extremely, I think it's extremely important that the, that the trial counsel should have had a, a chance to know, um, to, to know that before the trial. And trial counsel actually said to the court, I wanted to interview Mr. Keyes and they wouldn't let me. And the trial prosecutor did, didn't question that, didn't object to that, didn't say that was wrong. Because trial prosecutors are arguing, well, they could have found it out on their own. Well, there's a number of problems with that. Trial counsel argued, I couldn't find it out on my own. They wouldn't even let me talk to Mr. Keyes III. The other problem with it is, wait a minute, uh, it's 404B evidence, they're obligated to provide notice. The defense isn't obligated to go out and search for this. Um, I, I don't, so what is the justification for surprising the defense with it at trial? Uh, the, one of the other arguments, well, we just learned about it a few days, I think it was a few days, three days before trial. I hope I have that right, that's my memory. Well, then fine, give notice three days before trial. They didn't do that, they waited. They, they said, I mean, this is, their, they, they, this is what the trial pros prosecutor argued, said at the trial, well, we waited to see what kind of witness he would be. That's not what for the, how does that fit with 404B? It doesn't. Um, uh, they argued that, well, we, uh, I think they may still argue this on appeal. The rule doesn't apply because we didn't have a police report. Again, um, I don't know what's, what's was argued, uh, what's being argued by trial prosecutor. Uh, at trial, but it's not 404B. There's nothing to 404B that says it only applies to evidence, you know, that's reduced to a police report. So I'm assuming I don't have to spend any time on this, um, but I, maybe I will just a little bit, this uh, word act distinction. But that's all I want to say about that is people be rush low, 1989. Therefore, it's actually not precedent under MCR 7.215 J1. But what does rush low actually say? It's very unlike this case. Uh, there the issue was the victim had told the jury the defendant threatened to kill her 45 minutes before he stabbed her. Uh, so, you know, that's not at all like this case. It's a very different scenario. That really is the rejest of the crime. Um, this, is, this case is, a, as I've explained it, a, a problematic witness that the prosecution needed the jury to believe this witness. His father wasn't there. His father, by all accounts, his father was willing to take the fall for the son. So they needed the jury to believe Keith's third. The only way to do that was to convince the jury that the reason he's so bad is because he's scared. He's scared of Mr. Bosworth. Um, the other thing about uh, Rushlow, well, they cite Goddard, Michigan Supreme Court. And in a footnote, actually, in a footnote in Rushlow, they state that 404B wasn't even argued. So what does Goddard say, 1988? Uh, the thing about Goddard that I wanted to point out was Goddard is a 1988 case, so there was no B2 in 1988. There's no notice requirement regarding 404B until 1993 with Vandervliet, yep. and then later uh, it's codified under B2. So that's the first thing about Goddard. There was no notice requirement at the time. But a more important fact, I think, is um, um, there's no holding in Goddard that verbal threats fall outside 404B. The defendant in Goddard was convicted of murder. Mr. Frohn, and, my, my hunch is, and I can't my hunch is, is that the distinction between an oral versus chargeable, okay, right. if, if it makes a difference, it's not going to make a difference in this case, because at least from my, speaking only for myself, this was uncharged. I mean, this was, if believed, this could have been charged criminal, right? This th the threat I'm talking about. I, 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 mess, I didn't hear. I didn't register. My, my point is, I'm not. I'm not sure that this distinction makes a difference. Okay, I got you. I got you. And with that, in all, your favor. 
I appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate it. It took me appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'll end then by uh, returning to what I think maybe this case does come come down to, you know, harmless error. And, uh, and People v. Jackson, 2015, our Michigan Supreme Court said, requiring the prosecution to give pretrial notice of intent to introduce other acts evidence at trial is designed to promote reliable decision-making to prevent unfair surprise and to offer the defense an opportunity to marshal arguments regarding both relevancy and unfair prejudice. And that's exactly what uh, trial counsel argued to the judge. Um, he gave the judge opportunity after opportunity to slow down, to not let this go before the jury because it was unfair to the defense. It was unfair to the defense. It was critical testimony. He had no, he couldn't even ask a question in cross, he felt. It was a reasonable strategic decision to not ask questions in cross because he didn't know what the answers were going to be. They could blow up on him. So uh, for that reason, I think this case has to has to be retried. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? No? <clears throat> Morning, may it please the court. Heather Bloomquist on behalf of the Muskegon County Prosecutor's Office. Um, in light of the, the panel's statements as it relates to my argument as to whether or not a defendant's statement alone constitutes uh, a 404B or a statement falls outside the scope of 404B, um, I, I'm getting the sense that that might not be where I should be hanging my hat on this issue, um, but I, I would just rely to my arguments in the brief on that and move forward with the fact that this all happened within days of the trial. This threat was conveyed within a few days and the notice uh, under the, the MRE 404B2, notice must be reasonable and that it can be excused, the 14 days can be excused on good cause shown. The defendant's own statements made on the eve of his trial essentially is good cause for this to not have a written notice requirement that complies with the hard and fast notice requirement of 404B. Well, I, I agree with you. If a threat is made three days before the trial, let's say that you've got a defendant who's out on bond, he shows up, he brandishes a firearm, he says, you better not show up and testify. I mean, nobody would argue that you had to give notice 14 days ahead when it's, we're only three days out from the trial. But at that point, if you're the prosecutor, don't you have to get notice to the defense as fast as humanly possible in the most comprehensive way you can do it. And uh, your, your honor, I, I don't know if as fast as humanly possible would be the standard. It's reasonableness. And I, I get that, whether, I mean, we're, we're just days, we're 72 hours from the start of trial at that point. To my understanding, yes, yes. And I, I do believe, you know, given that this is the defendant's own statements and actions that then come to light within this, that there is, there is some honest, I mean, I know that's not what the rule says, but there is some duty to have a communication with your own client as to what he's doing before the trial. Now, again, that's not to burden shift to the defense. I can, I, I, I'm anticipating that, but this is the defendant's own statement. So for any sort of surprise or any sort of oh, prejudice. That, does that, he admit he said it? Uh, no, no. Well, of course it's a surprise. If they come up with something he says he never said, how, how would he possibly be on notice that he said something that he didn't say? And I, I, your honor, I guess I, with that, I, I, I don't disagree that that's not in the record. They had it in writing or on a recording or something. Okay, fine. You said it, my friend. Don't act surprised. But if, if he says they, they conjured this up, they invented this thing, and then let's not pretend that he's not surprised by it. Well, with in, in light of that, I'll, I'll shift to the next part, which is prejudice. <laughs> because looking at the totality of this witness's testimony, he's all over the place. He says one thing and then he says the exact opposite. He says he was threatened and then he says, oh, I made that up so that I could look good to everybody. And he actually comes fully off of these threats that he has disclosed and says, I made that up just to get what I want is my recollection of it. So is, is I, your argument that the fact that there was a clean recantation, the sort of thing that would require, would allow the defense to just dispense with an investigation because the guy just owned up to the fact that he lied about it? No, but I think looking at the any prejudice from this dis, this late notice, I think that dissipates though as soon as this actually ended up becoming, I think, good evidence for the defense that impeaches this witness's credibility. And so that goes more towards the prejudice argument. And then additionally, looking at harmless error on this, this is very brief testimony. It, it was relied upon by the people. I, I'm, I will say that, but it was relied upon by the people. But in this case, we also have 
ample evidence of the defendant's involvement in this murder. He has a confession to an inmate that that mirrors much of the other extraneous evidence. His cell phone turns off at the exact same time as the as the uh, as Mr. Keys, who testified. Their cell phones turn off within a minute of each other. They turn back on at within a minute of each other, and the murder happens in that time frame. He tells another inmate, who's a quote unquote jailhouse lawyer, all the facts of his case to get some assistance, and he tells that individual that he was involved with the shooting, he shot and killed this, uh, this victim, and that he did have these cell phones turned on and turned off, corroborating the uh, cell phone evidence, and other, other things were corroborated in this. So looking at any purported error in the admission of this brief testimony of, uh, of the threat, that the, the, the alleged threat that the defendant made against this witness, I would say that that's harmless when you look at the totality of the circumstances in this matter. Um, and so with that, I would open myself up to other questions. I'll okay, see. thank you, Your Honor. Just to end by saying greatly respect opposing counsel. She's a great, great lawyer as well. But um, okay, I mentioned I respect the previous counsel. I haven't had as many cases with uh, uh, opposing counsel, but she's a very good lawyer as well. But um, what I want to emphasize is that I don't read the record the same way she does regarding the value of this of this testimony the testimony from the jailhouse snitch and all this would not have carried the day they needed mr keys they knew uh, what they knew about these alleged threats mr uh uh bosworth never there's, there's no place in the record where he says oh yeah i did threaten i did threaten him so this was disputed this was disputed at trial critical to their case they knew about it three days in advance they could have given notice didn't even have to be written notice could have picked up the phone and, and called defense counsel said, this is what we're going to do. Oh, by the way, we didn't let you talk with Mr. Keyes the third. You know, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to let you interview him, maybe in our presence, but we're going to let you talk with him. None of that happened. They made the decision. They made the decision to surprise the defense. Unless the court has any questions. Uh, okay, thank you. No, nope, I don't, don't think so. All right, thank you both. Uh, matter is submitted. Turning now oh. to item number seven, people of the state of Michigan versus Hershey. Three six five four three six. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Mike Waldo from the State Appellate Defender Office on behalf of Mr. Hershey. Your Honors, I think that this is a case that just sort of moved along very expeditiously without due regard for Mr. Hershey's constitutional rights. And I think that that concept is reflected in the, the issues that we raised in this appeal. First, this case was pushed along more expeditiously than, than necessary and without paying uh, due deference to his constitutional right when I believe he was arrested without probable cause. Um, I'll move quickly to issue two, and I won't belabor this. Both opposing counsel and I submitted the same facts to your honors uh, in our brief. So I know it's your honors um, duty to, to Predictably, we came to different conclusions as to whether the, those facts establish probable cause, and it's your honor's duty to make that determination. Uh, the only point that I that I wanted to emphasize on this is that th there was virtually no investigation done by the responding officer here. He has the report of the stolen bike. Uh, he has a person standing in front of him. This is not some anonymous tip. There's a person who's actually talking to him and telling him, hey, there's a guy. He's got a stolen motorcycle. Now he's in the garage. Right, Your Honor. I, I agree that that's the true. The officer sees the motorcycle has very recently been repainted. Right. It had been repainted. Um, the point, Mr. Hill, he didn't testify. Um, we only sort of get his version of events through the officer's testimony. Right, right. But he is. Right. But this is not an anonymous tipster. It's not anonymous. True. But we we have no indication of that gentleman's veracity, any investigation that was done into that. Um, I, and, I, and I think what stands out to me is there are just very obvious things that I think the officer could have done and should have done. One thing might be to ask Mr. Hershey about it. You know, the testimony is that upon re receiving Mr. Hill's information, who doesn't have personal knowledge of the bike being stolen. I mean, he says that he had- He said the guy tried to sell him the bike for $200. Right. I don't know enough about the motorcycle market, <laughs> Your Honor, to know that that's a preposterous amount. He did say <laughs> Mr. Hershey tried to sell him a bike. He had seen on Facebook a bike that he believed it was this one. Um, I don't know if he was friends with the actual alleged victim in this. Um, but I, I guess the point and what, what, what I find um, 
interesting is that he didn't do anything. He, he, the officer simply went to the backyard and arrested. I think he had certainly reasonable suspicion at well, this point. He, he didn't just go in the backyard and arrest him. They, they made contact with the owner of the house and they said, there's some guy in your garage. And he says, oh, by all means, go check that guy out. Right. And immediately placed him under arrest. He didn't do anything to determine that this was, in fact, a stolen bike. Didn't con had no contact, at least from the record, as I understand it, with the alleged victim of this alleged theft. Um, made no effort to match VIN numbers or anything. Just sort of took Mr. Hill at his word. Um, made no effort to talk to Mr. Hershey. Woke him up and immediately placed him under arrest. Um, but the case, again, it was, it was moved along, I believe, expeditiously in an unreasonable manner when the trial court abused its discretion in denying the defense very reasonable motion to adjourn where the prosecution disclosed uh, the forensic report showing that the substance uncovered in that search into the incident to the arrest was in fact methamphetamine just two days before the trial. Again, in our briefs, we- how, how does that help you out? I mean, are, did you independently have the drugs tested after the fact and you got somebody who says it's not methamphetamine? I mean, if it's methamphetamine, it's methamphetamine. And whether you have one lab technician or 10 lab technicians and they're all gonna say the same thing, what difference does it make? Right, Your Honor, and I think this is an important point. We did not pursue independent testing um, on appeal at this stage of the case. The prosecution, uh, you know, we agree on the same test that should be applied, the, the Williams test, the same factors we've put forth in our briefing. The prosecution suggests along the lines of your question, Your Honor, that we have the burden to produce some sort of, or establish some sort of outcome determinative prejudice. And I think in this case, where we're asserting that the court abuses discretion in denying the motion to adjourn, that, that is not our burden. And I apologize, this is not a case that is, is in the briefing, um, but the case that I can cite for this proposition is People v. Suchi. That is 143 Mishap, 136. It is a 1985 case, so I recognize that that is not binding on this court. However, this court continues to cite this case um, in similar context. Recently, in 2021, this court cited the Suchi opinion in the context of a choice of counsel issue. Um, so I think this remains valid and good law. And what the court in, in the Suchi case did, I'll briefly talk about it. In that case, the prosecution endorsed two critical witnesses just four days before trial. The defense moved to adjourn and the trial court denied that motion. This court held that that was an abuse of discretion. Was and what the court- I'm sorry, was that a criminal case? Yes, Your Honor, a was criminal it, case. Did it deal with uh, 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 whether an, a suspected narcotics was in fact narcotics? No, Your Honor, it so didn't. Here, it involved I'm, more a more so serious. Here's events. my, and I'm trying to remember. There must have been a field test in this case, there was. identifying its methamphetamine. He's charged with methamphetamine. Everybody knows it's methamphetamine. And three days before trial, it comes back as methamphetamine. So, so then the, the question becomes, and I think this was Judge Shea's point, is like, had this come in a month, two months earlier, how would have the cross examination? I mean, was the issue this wasn't really methamphetamine? What I think, Your Honor, um, I appreciate the points in the question. I'll do my best to answer it. What I think the, this court in the Suchi opinion that I cited mm -hmm. ultimately boiled the prejudice, because that is one of the problems that the court needs to consider, is looking at how probative this evidence is and how it may have had a conceivable impact on the defense. And so in this case, and in, and in that case, they, the defense couldn't establish, and this was sort of the point of contention, that had they had two weeks notice rather than four days notice that the outcome of the trial could would reasonably have been different. That's not what, what was established and that was not the defense burden to establish that um, because they were so critical. And here, the positive test, it's, it's, it's the entire case. And I, the one thing- but Is there any reason under the sun to think this wasn't methamphetamine? No. I mean, if, if the test is 100% accurate, how can there possibly be any prejudice? because it was only disclosed to the defense two days before trial, Your Honor. The field test is not 100% accurate. That's why it's not admissible. No, I, right, I, I get that. But it, it, look, if you were really concerned about this after trial, in, in order to try to press this issue, I suppose you could have had an independent test done of it. But I think the end result that we're left with is there's no reason whatsoever to believe this isn't methamphetamine. I can't give you... I can't answer that question, Your Honor. And if that's how this case is going to turn, then I then I can't I can't give you reason to believe that this was not methamphetamine. But it's a fairness. He has a constitutional right to present a defense. It's a notice issue, um, and it is 
I mean, if it was if it was a witness indoors two days before trial who said, I saw Mr. Hershey over at that house, that's not going to be that probative to the case. And there would be no certainly no justifiable relief in that case. The positive test is exactly what needed is what this case turned on. And what trial counsel during the uh, the motion to adjourn, would he uh, I this is a bit of an assumption, but I believe going into that trial three days before trial, the defense the plan defense is to say that they can't carry their burden of establishing this as methamphetamine. Um, pr during the oral argument on the motion to adjourn, counsel notices that this was, I mean, this was less than a gram of, of, of a substance that ultimately tested positive. And trial counsel states to the court that he's not even sure that this could be tested such a small amount. So I think that that is the defense strategy that is going in and that changes when just two days before trial, um, they're informed that there is a test that was conducted, a reliable test. The results are coming in. And so instead, the defense was left with essentially arguing contamination. That's what the defense theory that was put forth. And the jury um, obviously didn't buy it. So unless there are further questions at this time. I don't think so. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. May it please the court, Heather Bloomquist on behalf of the Muskegon County Prosecutor's Office for the People. Um, I'll just start out with the probable cause argument. I'm, I'm looking specifically at page four of my brief, Maryland versus Pringle. It's a United States Supreme Court case that says that probable cause is a practical, non-technical concept that or conception that deals with the factual and practical considerations of everyday life on which reasonable and prudent men, not legal technicians, act. And with that lens, looking at what this officer had on the scene when he appears to this call, there was probable cause. We have an unknown man who drives a altered motorcycle that looks like the one that's stolen on Facebook, parks it, offers to sell it for what is an unreasonably low amount, which would alert that something's amiss. Some crime is afoot here. Recently painted, that's what saying, altered, right? Yes, and, and I, I will say we, we're at a bit of a disadvantage because there was no motion to suppress, but if we look at the um, the PSIR and the, the pre-sentence investigation report facts, there's additional facts that also show that the ignition was pried off as well. That wasn't in the trial um, testimony, but that fact is in the lower court record that, that that was altered as well so that there wasn't a key needed to operate this. Um, additionally, it, it's repainted. This is an unknown man who then stumbles into it, you know, that's me editorializing a little. He goes into a garage and then ends up sleeping and, and these people are not sure who he is. And the officer, um, I, I do believe there's some evidence in the, it's either in the PSI or in the, the trial transcript that the officer was also familiar with the defendant as well. Um, so with that, looking at that with a non-technical legal lens, that does give probable cause that a crime of, of uh, possession of stolen property at the least or, um, uh, or possession of a, of a stolen motor vehicle was committed by this offender uh, to support the arrest. And then the search incident to this arrest was also valid. So um, that's, that's my position as it relates to issue one. Next, turning to issue two, I, I would just echo um, Judge Cameron, what, what you've said is this field test was methamphetamine months before. The lab confirmed that later this could have been tested independently by either party and it wasn't. Um, and given that the adjournment uh, wasn't necessary in this matter, and I don't think that the factors that are outlined uh, to warrant an adjournment in this were met. And so the court did not abuse its discretion in denying it. And other than that, I would, I would uh, open myself up for any other questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Waldo. Thank you, just a brief uh, response to Ms. Bloomquist's argument um, regarding the diligence part uh, prong of the test regarding the, the court's denial of the motion to adjourn. It's not, the trial judge said this as well during the motion, it's not the defense's job to prove innocence. It was the people's job to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And they did that by having this evidence tested, but as I said just a few moments ago, this was tested, this was provided to the defense just two days before, and that's a very reasonable request that the defense made to prepare for that evidence. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. All right, the matter is submitted. Turning now to item number five, Adala versus Houghton County, 
Board of Road Commissioners 366633. We've got a criminal case left. Did I miss them? Yeah, eight. Ah, I'm sorry. Let me back up a little bit. I imagine is number nine on. Yeah, that's remote? after the break. Okay, that's after the break. Okay, yeah, that's after the break. thank you. Uh, item number eight: People of State of Michigan versus Shannon three six three zero three five. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Maya Menlo of the State Appellate Defender Office, appearing on behalf of Jonathan Shannon. I'd like to start today with the 404B section of my argument. We've raised a number of things as prosecutorial error and then in the alternative as ineffective assistance. This 404B issue um, is pretty flagrant. And in fact, the prosecutor concedes that testimony about Mr. Shannon allegedly being a drug dealer was inadmissible and was improper. And it was other bad acts evidence and totally irrelevant in a CSC4 case. It only served to prejudice the jury against Mr. Shannon. We disagree, however, about prejudice. And here, the prejudice is, to me, quite obvious. We're not talking about just any drug. We're not saying that he sold marijuana or you know, gave someone a prescription pill when he shouldn't have. This is heroin in the middle of an opioid crisis. And the prosecutor asked several questions to further develop this improper testimony. He asked whether the witness got heroin from Mr. Shannon specifically. Of course, she says she did. Then he asked if she had ever used heroin before she met Mr. Shannon, and she said she had not. So now we have the jury hearing testimony that Mr. Shannon is supposedly a heroin dealer and also a heroin pusher, if we believe what the witness has to say. So again, this drug is killing thousands of people every year. It's a major public health crisis, and it has nothing to do with the case, but it's part of the case. To make matters worse, the prosecutor then argues in closing and again mentions the heroin, says Mr. Shannon has a history of delivering heroin. So this is a plain error if I've ever seen one. It affects Mr. Shannon's substantial rights because we know that jury, jury members may have biases, personal experiences, other hangups about heroin. I'm sure we've all read transcripts in a case involving drugs where jurors are excused because they have a personal experience, they have a family experience. It's just going to be too difficult for them to sit on this jury involving a, a case with drugs. Well, here, those questions weren't asked because this is not a case involving drugs. So there may well have been members of the jury who had those hangups and who had those biases and nevertheless convicted Mr. Shannon here. The Michigan Supreme Court and this court in many cases have recognized that errors are particularly harmful in credibility contests, which this was one, where you have testimony by a witness, no DNA, no video, nothing else that definitively demonstrates that this happens. Of course, those cases are prosecuted and they can be properly prosecuted. But in this case, just about every error that you can imagine in a CSC case occurred. There's another but perhaps less egregious 404B type of issue that is worth mentioning, especially because this is a cumulative type analysis and we've raised cumulative errors sort of separately underneath this umbrella, um, but the court can certainly look to the cumulative prejudice. And that additional issue is that a detective testified at the prosecutor's prompting that she knew Mr. Shannon from another investigation and that she didn't go and talk to him because he had retained an attorney in connection with another incident that had been reported. Now. The prosecutor says that Mr. Shannon could have been a witness, and so the jury didn't know necessarily that he was a suspect. I don't know whether witnesses these days are retaining attorneys, but I think it was very clear from the testimony that the jury could have and likely did infer that Mr. Shannon is this big bad guy, right? Because he deals heroin, he's involved in another incident, and that's exactly the type of scenario and the type of prejudice that 404B is designed to prevent. So this court should find that that was plain error and rewards reversal. And then in the alternative, of course, we've raised ineffective assistance. But I do sort of want to give that a little nuance here. The, the prosecutor is asking this court to rule that the trial prosecutor can introduce inadmissible, unnoticed other acts evidence, essentially ambush trial counsel with this stuff about drugs and this other investigation. And then when trial counsel doesn't object, then we have no remedy. And that there's there's just nowhere we can go there. And so that is that is frustrating, right? Because in the moment, trial counsel might make a decision to stay away from the drugs because it is harmful and they don't want to inflame the jury further and call more attention to it. Now, in this case, I wish the trial attorney had called for a sidebar and put it on the record, you know, outside the presence of the jury done something to preserve the objection. I wish that had happened and that's why we raise it this way. But this court should not 
find that there's no deficient performance and no prejudice because of the prosecutor's ambush. And so I, I just want to put a finer point on that because it's raised both ways. It's got merit in both iterations. But to me, the better home for this is in prosecutorial error. If there are no questions about that issue, I will move on to the admission of the text messages, which were hearsay. These are messages between the complaining witness and a third party stating the allegations against Mr. Shannon all over again. And of course, just like any hearsay that restates prior or, or, or the same allegations over and over again, these allow the court, I'm sorry, allow the jury to conclude that this witness is credible because she's telling the same story over and over again. But the, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. This is one of those situations too, where there actually was an objection. And the promise was that this was coming in, not to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but merely to show why what happened next happened next, right? It, well, it, 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 as to the text messages, unfortunately, Your Honor, the trial counsel stipulated to the introduction right, right, but, of but, the messages. Right, but there are other statements that she made that the, the victim, alleged victim made where there was an objection and it was offered to prove that they, they argued that it was not being offered to prove the truth in that asserted. And then it was used for that purpose in closing argument, right? The prosecutor that, absolutely the that used it for most. that purpose. Yes. And, and repeated in closing, she's told the same story right. four times. She, and we didn't, we haven't even started on the forensic interview yet, but that's another issue, right? So it's, we're, you know, knocking down every opportunity for the defense to impeach her credibility or to call her credibility into question by introducing these improper hearsay statements. And of course, it's briefed, but these are prior consistent statements that only come in under very specific circumstances, right. and those circumstances are not present right. here. Yes. So thank you for the question. And yeah, Judge I'm sorry. Cameron, I mean, I didn't mean to pull you away oh, from not what at you all. wanted to make, because I, I recognize that there was a stipulation on some of it. And that was error. And, and we raise it as ineffective assistance. It's totally unclear why an attorney would stipulate to messages coming in like these. And there's two problems with the messages, really. You've got the restating of the allegations that allows the prosecutor to argue she's credible. And then you have this reference to lock him up, right. now, lock this we, MF up. Right. Now, that, that's, those are the text messages with her friend. Correct. Yes. Between the complaining witness and the friend. Yes. So there are problems all over these messages and they shouldn't have been admitted. Prosecutors should not have offered them and trial counsel should not have stipulated. So we have we have two sort of different ways to look at this here. The discussion of the penalty, of course, the court knows that is way out of bounds. It injects this extraneous issue of penalty. The jury is not supposed to consider it. They're instructed not to consider possible penalty. But then when this is fed to them in a text message, it says we want him locked up multiple times. It, it really does not comport with due process or justice. This is not the kind of trial that a pub, the public or any member of the bench or bar can sit by and watch and think that this was conducted fairly because it just was not. As I mentioned, those messages and other pieces of inadmissible hearsay are used to bolster the complainant's credibility. I use that term because the Michigan Supreme Court uses that term. You can bolster in a proper way and you can bolster in an improper way. So when you use something improper to augment or enhance the credibility of a witness, you're improperly bolstering, right? The prosecutor doesn't have to stand up and say, I know this complaining witness is telling the truth to improperly bolster. That's not what I mean. That, and that actually didn't happen here. That's one of the few that's things that- That's vouching, not bolstering. Correct. Anyway. Exactly, Your Honor. So I just want to make really clear that I'm saying that the improper bolstering occurred with the inadmissible evidence and that's what made it error. The last thing I'll say about the text messages is even if the court finds that they were admissible or you know that error is waived, we've raised it as ineffective assistance, but we also have a responsibility as agents of, uh, as, as officers of the court and people who are supposed to be agents of justice to redact things that are improper. And so at the very least, these messages should have been redacted as to the offensive comment I won't, I won't repeat again. I promised I was gonna talk about the forensic interview, so I will do that briefly. This was yet another instance of the prosecutor using prior consistent statements to boost the complaining witness's credibility. He asked, did you do a forensic interview? Did you, do, did you tell them what you said here today? And did you tell them the truth? I mean, that is, that is so problematic. And in fact, I didn't raise this because I wasn't aware of it at the time I wrote my brief, but it's worth mentioning that your former colleague, Judge Shapiro has commented in at least one case that not only is the type of evidence that came in here 
problematic, but any reference to a forensic interview could be problematic and usually is. There are some situations where I can imagine a forensic interview being admissible. We talked already about prior consistent statements that there are limited circumstances where they come in. Here though, we have prior consistent statements with no recent charge of fabrication and the complaining witness getting on the stand and saying, I told them the truth, I told them what I did here today. It's, it's just like in a theft case, for example, an officer coming to the scene, talking with a victim of a theft, and then getting on the stand at trial and testifying to, yes, I talked with the victim of the theft at the scene. I heard him testify in court today. They were the exact same thing. He hands you the report. Can you review the report? It, will it refresh your recollection? Yes, he reviews. Now look up. Is what the victim said on the stand the same thing that you put in your report? Yes. I mean, there's a many, many reasons we don't allow that, but that's the exact equivalent of what happened here was the complaining witness being allowed to say that she said the same thing previously and the prosecutor using it in closing repeatedly to emphasize that that makes her credible. I also have take issue with some of the things in the prosecutor's closing argument, but my brief addresses those. I want to take one more second, though, to talk about cumulative error. So if we take one of these errors in isolation, maybe it's not enough. I think especially the mention of Mr. Shannon's past is more than enough to, to warrant reversal. But even the court disagrees with me. You can look at each of these things individually and accumulate the error. And I've briefed that. I've given some examples of situations where the prosecutor has stepped out of bounds one too many times for this court or for the Sixth Circuit or for other courts. And they say, we just can't have this. We just can't have a situation where the prosecutor is repeatedly doing things that are not even on the line, right? That are over the line. And that, because that doesn't result in a just outcome. And that makes the public feel like there's no justice, there's no fairness when the prosecutor is doing these things repeatedly and using these, these pieces of inadmissible evidence to convict the accused. You can also look at cumulative error under the ineffective assistance framework. So I'd ask the court to do that as well. If it doesn't find plain error, which I wholeheartedly believe there is here, you can also look at the ineffective assistance issues that we've raised and accumulate that prejudice to find that ultimately had trial counsel been effective, there's a reasonable probability of a different outcome. In a case where there was DNA or video, this might be a little bit different. We would have a harder time. Here, there's none of that. And it was a credibility contest. Repeatedly, this court and the Michigan Supreme Court have treated those credibility contests differently. So given that, unless there are any questions about the new trial issues, I would like to ask this court to vacate Mr. Shannon's convictions and grant a new trial. As to the sentencing issues, I've raised a couple of things regarding the Sex Offender Registration Act. I'd like to just point the court to the case of People versus Cardaz, K-A-R-D-A-S-Z. It's a Michigan Supreme Court case number 16508, where the Michigan Supreme Court has granted leave to determine whether the sex offender registry and its lifetime uh, requirements <laughs> as applied to a person who is convicted of CSC one is cruel or unusual. Of course, that's a much more serious case than we have here. This is a CSC four. Um, so I just like the court to be aware that that is a live conversation. And I'm not aware of any binding precedent that says a 25 year mandatory registry with no risk assessment and no off ramp is proportionate to a CSC four. So I ask the court to take a look at that as well. I'll reserve my remaining time. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning. One more time, Your Honors. Mm -hmm. Katie went with the Kent County Prosecutor's Office on behalf of the people. Um, I know there's a, several issues here in the brief, and so I want to focus my uh, argument on the points that defense counsel made in my response to them today, uh, starting with the 404B evidence. So I think there was a little bit of a mischaracterization in our, our response, um, and, and I don't fault Ms. Menlo for that. She's a fantastic attorney who I, I enjoy working with. Um, but with respect to what we are conceding here, I'm conceding that there was no notice of a 404B. I'm not conceding that this evidence would have been inadmissible under 404B had that notice been provided. Um, so we jump straight to the prejudice just because, you know, when you read, read Strickland, it can be more efficient to just jump to the prejudice aspect. Same with plain air affecting substantial rights, um, recognizing that this was unnoticed. But I believe that head trial counsel or trial APA in this case 
noticed this as 404B, it would have been relevant and it was relevant to establish the opportunity here. So um, our defendant in this case, the only way that he's connected to this family that we know of is through this drug uh, activity. And in this particular case, we have testimony. He was the drug dealer for um, our victim's mother. He, and was a, he was originally. He was originally, yes. Right. But then, you then know, the they, they call him uncle, he becomes friends. So at the point she's there, the, the drugs really have nothing to do with her relationship with him. So I, I understand I don't, that point. And, okay. and I would point. Well, it's, a, it's an important point. Yeah, yeah. And I, I also would point the court to the testimony that he was cleaning up. So this isn't as, um, I would say, as harmful or as prejudicial as evidence if we were to say, you know, he's still actively involved in drugs. We're just painting him as this drug dealer who's. Um, propensity is being argued to the jury. Um, but when we look, you know, even if I, I accept the the position of the court and, and the arguments made by defense counsel, when we turn to prejudice, we turn to whether this affected substantial rights under the plain error analysis and then prejudice under Strickland. But stop for a minute on prejudice. Sure. This, at least as far as I can tell, is just a straight up credibility contest. There's no corroborating evidence. There's no forensic evidence. There's no nothing. It's just his word against her word, right? I would disagree to some extent. I would say that the mom's testimony is corroborating of her demeanor after this occurred. Uh, you know, she comes home and mom sure, says sure. she's hysterical. Right. Right. So it provides, that corroborates the victim's testimony that something happened to me that night. You know, I was touched by him in some way. Otherwise, you know, if this was the case, victim came home, went to bed, mom was still asleep, none of this happened, I would agree that it's a straight he said, she said, but I think mom's testimony does corroborate that something happened to the victim that evening. Um, so when it comes to prejudice, I, I, I make this point in my brief, but no party in this case was drug free. I think we have ma three main actors in this case. We have mom, we have victim, and then we have our defendant. And there's testimony that came in throughout trial that all three of these individuals were involved in drug activity. You know, mom testifies, he was my drug dealer. I did heroin, I was a drug addict. So that gives reason potentially for the jury to be prejudiced against her. There's testimony that the victim was smoking marijuana underage with her boyfriend. That gives reason for the jury to prejudice her. And then this testimony about the defendant. But, but in terms of the charge defense, criminal sexual conduct, drug use, it could have easily been resolved without mentioning anything about drugs. We didn't have to, the jury didn't have to learn about mom having a heroin problem. We've seen the closing why that happened, but the prosecutor elicited that information. The jury didn't have to hear uh, about defendant being involved in drugs or being a drug dealer for this criminal sexual conduct because it had nothing to do with the crime. But in the end, the prosecutor paints probably appropriately so the victim being from a broken home, very sympathetic with a broken mother who puts her in a situation to be with this broken defendant, elevating on what is there are far more, I mean, this is a criminal sexual encounter, fourth degree. Why is this important is probably at some point the jury might be thinking. And when you throw in drugs and the sympathy for the victim and, and the mother, and he's the drug dealer who may have helped create this, this situation, um, it, it, it does change the dynamics in, in a CSC4 case. And I, I would respond, is it necessary? Probably not. But when we look at the 404B test, it's not whether or not this evidence is necessary, but whether or not there's a non-propensity purpose for it. And I would submit to the court that it wasn't used for propensity in this instance, but it was used to show the opportunity that this defendant had um, to become close to this victim and how this defendant was in this victim's life. But you also have to show that it's not substantially more prejudicial than probative. I mean, that's where I'm struggling with this. I'm not suggesting that there, you, you couldn't conjure some proper purpose for putting it in, but my gosh, I mean, what is this evidence doing in a CSC case? And, and I, I, I understand the difficulty of the argument I'm making, uh, your honors. And, and so that's why, you know, instead of flushing this all out in my brief, we went straight to the prejudice aspect of whether or not this actually affected the outcome. Of all right, trial. Well, go to her next point about the fact that he was under investigation and he hired a lawyer. What in the world was that doing in the record? I, again, I, I don't know why this testimony was necessarily elicited with respect to the investigation, but what, when I read through it, what I grabbed from this was it explained why she was not able to have contact with him. Oftentimes what we present to a jury is, 
you know, we called the defendant. He didn't answer. We called the defendant. We were able to talk with him. And in this case, she explained why she wasn't able to have that opportunity because he had a retained attorney with respect to a different incident. Um, so I, I, I see your face, Judge Yates, and I understand um, that my argument is not very convincing in that regard. Um, but again, I'm up here making the best argument I think I can. Um, with respect to the hearsay issue, uh, I know counsel uh, recognized the waiver, and so we're more on an ineffective assistance type of issue here. Um, I would argue, first of all, that I think I would want to point out to the court that there were redactions made to these text messages. Um, so this wasn't a you know, flimsy, let's just let this be before the jury. The record shows that this attorney here and the trial APA worked together to find out or to determine what needed to be redacted. So there was some trial strategy here that we don't, we don't have a record of at this point in time. Um, but I, when you look to the actual trial and this, the, the testimony that came in about the text messages, these weren't read to the jury. I mean, it was submitted to the jury, but it wasn't so inflammatory that our trial prosecutor walked her through it. You know, you know, you say here, he wants to be locked up. Why do you say that? Or you, you say here that he touched your butt. That's exactly what you said in trial today. You know, that's not pointed out. It's why did you text her? Because I thought she would listen. Well, that, the problem is in the closing argument. I don't know how you can make the argument you made if you read the closing argument, and because it, it's not used just about contact in the police. He, 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 rams at home somebody I, has to have a talk with this prosecutor i i knowing the rules uh, for a fair trial because this has been exceeded a, a great a great length i did read the the closing your honor and i the most i can say about that is just the jury instruction that they're not supposed to consider uh the lawyer's arguments as evidence but i also only so i far, i know the i i see the writing on the wall with respect to this case so i i'm trying to make the best argument I can by also being respectful to the court's position. Um, but I, I do know that he said that in the closing. Um, so it did use it in a different way than it came in. Um, but I think all I can argue to the court at this point is those jury instructions and whether or not that cures the prejudice in that case. Um, with respect to the forensic interview, um, counsel very kindly sent me the case that she referred to um, in her argument today. It was Donovan. Uh, People v. Dunifin 358070, which Judge Shapiro wrote a concurrence for. Um, I would distinguish our case from that case in the in that, well, one, this court found no error, and I believe Judge Yates was on the panel of that with respect to the forensic interviewer's testimony. Um, however, in that case, it was the forensic interviewer taking the stand and talking about the protocol and how they set up a process for victims or, or alleged victims of sexual abuse to tell the truth. So it was about, we try to clear the air for suggestibility. Um, we establish a rapport with them. We create a neutral environment with them. And that's not what we have in this case with respect to the forensic interview. You know, they, the trial prosecutor did ask about the forensic interview. Did you undergo one? Did you say the same thing you said here? Were you telling the truth? Yes. But no specific statements were listed through the forensic interviewer, which is when I think this becomes very inflammatory is when we actually, you see a prosecutor put the forensic interviewer on the stand and testify about the disclosures made. Um, so I would distinguish the cases in that way. And then the concerns that Judge Shapiro had about forensic interviews, I think relate more to the type of testimony that was at issue in Dunifin. Um, Apart from that, I, I would rely on my brief with respect to the SORA issues, um, recognizing the case that Sister Counsel raised as well that's before our Supreme Court. Um, but otherwise, does this court have any other questions? No, I don't. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Well, I do like being pointed out when I'm incorrect. So I went back and looked at the people's brief and I see where they're saying that they acknowledge that the witness's testimony as to the 404B issue falls within the purview of 404B, but then they believe it's relevant to establish the details of how the witness knew the new Mr. Shannon here. So I appreciate that being pointed out, but the reality is here that you had two witnesses, the complaining witness and the, the witness who testified about the drugs, saying that they knew Mr. Shannon from the neighborhood. So that had already been established, that they know each other from living in the na same neighborhood in a, in a past housing situation. So there's no evidence that the complaining witness herself knew about the drug dealing, and there was no need to establish that. 
what's very important here is that even if this had been offered for a proper purpose, I believe it would have been excluded under MRE 403 because it is more prejudicial than it is probative by a mile. And the court is already well aware of this case not involving any drugs, except that the complaining witness used marijuana on the night of the incident, which of course is relevant for an entirely different purpose, her perception of events, her ability to remember things. I mean, that's coming in every time. But nothing about heroin was relevant and had, had no place in this case, as I think the court recognizes. The question of whether it was proper for the detective to testify that she had tried to interview the defendant or wanted to interview him, but then was not able to do that because he had retained an attorney. That might have been appropriate if the defense had raised the issue of you didn't interview the defendant, right? You didn't interview Mr. Shannon. You know, you, your, your investigation was incomplete. We've all seen that done, but that did not happen here. There was no door opening. So that was improper under 404B as well. As to the text messages, I had wanted to point out and forgot that there was no limiting instruction given. So they were admitted into evidence. They were referenced in closing. There was no limiting instruction about you can only use these for, for some limited purpose. So they were absolutely fair game for the jury to improperly use as evidence of Mr. Shannon's guilt. And the last thing I'll say is that the way, and it's a concurrence in an unpublished opinion, but I just find the points really persuasive. The way I read Judge Shapiro's concurrence in Donovan is that any testimony that the complaining witness has participated in a forensic interview is inherently problematic. And what he says is that those references implicitly inform the jury that the child made or reiterated the allegations of abuse during a specialized procedure and that the examiner found the child credible, even without the examiner testifying to that. And the way that Judge Shapiro comes to that conclusion is that it, he says it does not take any special insight for the jurors to realize that the fact that defendant was charged with crimes after that interview means that the interviewer confirmed the allegations or found the complaining witness to be credible. So that's even just in the context of the fact of the, of the complainant going through the interview. But here what we've raised is that the complainant sat in court and said, I said the same things in the interview as I'm saying today and I was telling the truth. So again, one of many examples of prosecutor, prosecutor error in this case that requires reversal. Okay. I think thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. That matter is submitted. That takes us to the end of our 10 o'clock docket. Uh, we'll uh, resume court at five minutes after uh, 12. <clears throat>
makes me nervous in any case where there's a request for writ of mandamus because you have to show a clear legal right and the other party has to have a clear legal duty. And obviously a road commission has to balance the safety of all the roads in the county and decide whether, where to allocate resources, doesn't it? Yes, of course it does. And uh, that brings me to my next point, um, Your Honor, which is that in this case, an ambulance will not even try to access the residents of Rila Road. The school bus doesn't run. The sheriff has issued a statement saying that the situation makes the road uh, unsafe for the residents of Rila Road. And this is particularly tr troublesome because one of the residents of the road has type one diabetes and there are children who live down this road. And so for, but it, it's, it, 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 to be... it, it, but it's it's not just repairing the road here. It's a major rebuild, isn't it? I mean, they have to raise it up above the flood level, which sounds like it's a, at least two feet up, right? Well, Your Honor, um, the law states that uh, a defect in the roadway, road bed, um, is eligible and, and must be repaired under the statute. That was held in the Carver case, uh, which is a, a very old case, as many of these um, road commission cases are, that a defect in the roadbed is in fact, uh, must in fact be repaired if the defect makes it unsafe for travel and does not meet the reasonable safety standard, which this clearly does not. Um, so I, I had uh, two questions, one based on what you said, in terms of your reasonable reasonability analysis seems to take in consideration the folks, your clients, who live on this road. You yes. know, diabetes, school, children who need to go to school. You're, you're taking into the unique needs of, the, of your clients who are on this road. But in terms of, does that matter in terms of duty? I mean, a duty is a duty. Uh, does the duty change depending on the needs of your clients? Does it matter that your clients have diabetes? Does it matter that your clients have children who need to go to school? Would, would, would you be in a worse position if you, your clients didn't have children? My point is, it seems to me a statutory duty is a statutory duty. Maybe that turns on reasonableness. Right. And maybe maybe... Maybe that's what it is, but so th that's the first, I don't know if it's a question, but that's sort of something I'm struggling with. And it, and in terms of the roadbed, it seems to me, so we have a flooding here of that it becomes impassable, as you said, for three weeks to a month. It seems to me that if this would have been a flooding that washed out the road to the point of having a, a 20 foot long 22 inch deep uh, hole in the road that would affect the the road bed itself right that's the road bed versus here uh, in maybe this week the road bed is perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with the road bed today because it's not flooded it seems to me that this is a a problem with the design of the road. It was designed not high enough or to, a, to anticipate flooding. So I, I'm making a distinction between a river that washes a road out or a 22 inch deep pothole versus a road that is for three weeks to a year impassable. But when that flooding subsides, the bed itself, the road itself is perfectly fine. I mean, what, what, what's your response to that? My response to that um, goes back to the Carver case from 1886, which makes it very clear that the construction of the road can be the defect of the road, as, is, as can be neglecting to maintain the road. And in this case, I would say, I, I believe that both of those are true. 
the defect in the road stems from the construction. And that was the duty of the road commission to do properly to begin with. And the fact that they have refused over time and, and many requests from Mr. Ryla and his family to correct the problem, um, that is, that's <clears throat> the negligence that's involved. And when they are keenly aware of the risk that this situation puts Mr. Ryla and his family at. Let me ask you this. Let's say that instead of your client and his family being at the end of this road, at the end of the road instead were some summer cottages and people would come up and spend the summer at their cottages and then they'd leave. So the flooding in the spring really wouldn't have any impact on their use of their property. Would the road be defective under those circumstances? Yes, the road is still defective. The, the, the statute doesn't say that the duty of the road commission depends on how often the road is used or by how many people or by whom the road is used. I, I agree the the duty is the duty. And in this situation, the road commission is not meeting its duty. It the road me. is not passable and open as this court has determined in numerous cases that, that it must be, it, it's not, it doesn't meet the bar. I should know this, but I, notes are in, I didn't bring this particular case as notes or at least the complete ones. <clears throat> when, tell me historically, when was the road built and when were the houses built, your, particularly your clients? My client's home, um, you're testing my memory here. Um, his home has been there for, I believe around 20 years. Um, but again, the duty is the duty. I don't. I don't. No, no, no. I understand. I'm just saying oh. it, it, it. It's always flooded since they Rahalas have owned it. Correct. I believe that is true. Right. Yes. And then when was this road put in? I don't know, and I could not get that information from from the road commission. I believe the road has been there. Um, I, I don't. Re I don't want to guess, but it has been there certainly as long as the Ryla homes have been there. So at least 20 years. And, and this is the cause of action you've chosen. You didn't, have you considered other potential remedies to, to get this done? Well, the road commission is the public body with the duty to perform this function. No other no other entity has the duty except the commission, and that rests on um, MCL 224.21 subsection 2. Um, this, they are the body where the responsibility lies, and the writ of mandamus, I mean, I understand that it's um, sort of an exceptional relief request, but other courts have granted mandamus in relation to road maintenance. And it's clear that the duty of the road commission is not ministerial here. And that it's important to know the trial court issued summary disposition in this case based on two, um, two mistaken determinations. One, that the road commission's duty is not ministerial, that it's discretionary. And that he couldn't order the mandamus because it would require the road commission to expend funds. Neither one of those are accurate. Um, when we get to the duty discussion, it's clear that this court and the Michigan Supreme Court has held that the duty articulated in this act is mandatory. Um, the word shall is used, which has been used in, in other statutes, of course, and which this court has determined on numerous occasions, um, fairly recently in 2020 in the Warren City Council versus Buffa case, that shall means it is a mandatory directive, not a discretionary one. And interestingly, this act uses the word may when it discusses how the maintenance and repairs can be performed, but it uses shall when it says the duty has to be performed. Yes, this I is not- recall some municipalities tried to make the same argument about repairing sidewalks. 
you know, we're broke. Uh, we've got 500 miles of sidewalks. We, we can't fix them all. And the courts have said tough. I mean, you don't get an out for, for that. The, right. And furthermore, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. This, the Zoom no, is a little awkward right. sometimes. Uh, isn't there a problem with discretion if we try to order them to fix it in some particular way, though? I mean, obviously, they could build a bridge. They could raise it three feet. There are a lot of different ways to address it. So right. if, if you write our writ of mandamus for us, what does it say? The relief that was requested in this case um, states that what is sought is an uh, to, for the trial court to enter an order compelling the road commission to repair the road and make it safe and convenient for public travel in accord with their mandatory duty. I agree with you. This court and nor the trial court could order specifically the road be raised so many inches. That's not allowed. Or so many culverts of such a capacity need to be installed. Not allowed. The road the road commission does have discretion about how to meet their duty, but they don't have discretion about whether to meet their duty. What That's about, the crux. What about when? I mean, when, <laughs> when would when would they have to have that? Would, would we say within 12 months? Or what would you be asking if either us or the trial court, if we agree with your position, when would they need to do it? With, by all deliberate speed? Uh, I mean, what, 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 when does it need to be done by? Well, um, my clients certainly would like it done before next spring. I realize that is not likely and not reasonable. However, within two years seems to me reasonable. And I just want to touch on the financial piece that was uh, raised. It is worth noting that this road commission um, basically is flush. They have a, a budget of over $15 million, and at, in their um, Public Act 506 compliance reporting indicated uh, for 2023 that they had nearly a $2.5 million surplus. So the, you know, the arguments that they don't have the money or can't come up with the money now or within two years or within three years, they, they they just don't fly here. Did they get a bunch of money from the infrastructure bill or something? Because I know a lot of local governments are just a wash in federal money right now, but it's not getting, it's not permanent. Right. It's not permanent. I understand that. But the fact is, uh, and it's worth noting that the estimate for this project is approximately $250,000. So in the scheme of this road commission's budget, this project, um, you know, there's really there is no good reason that this project has not already occurred and certainly no reason that it cannot occur in a reasonable time frame. Well, which, I, I, I miss that. What the two hundred and fifty thousand would do what? That's the estimated cost for the repair that would make the road passable. Which, which remind me what that repair is. Well, I mean. That was when the road commission was considering this project, they were talking about raising the road. That is not the relief requested by my client. They could put in culverts. They could build a bridge. They could raise the road if that's what their engineers determine is proper. There are many ways to go about it, and it is th within their discretion to, to decide how, but not if. I know you, you said that the statute doesn't give any discretion and that, that appears to be the case. I also realize that there's a longstanding frustration with people in the Upper Peninsula uh, with you know, everyone down here doesn't go up there. They don't understand it, somewhat different culture, but I, I love the UP, I'm up there myself. I live in Northern Michigan, um, but there are an awful lot of remote roads up there. Um, you know, what would be the situation if taking Judge Cameron's scenario, just a, a pothole road, you know, I mean, are you going to have everybody who's got a camp, a deer shack at the end of a road that's never used, as, you know, file mandamus actions to say, you know, repair this? I mean, at, at some point, there's an awful lot of roads up there that probably could use some sprucing up. I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, what, what, certain that is true. the kind of domino okay. effect or you've got an extraordinary case here. Um, right. But as Judge Cameron points out, whether somebody's got diabetes, whether someone can't get to school or even access their house, doesn't seem to be part of the duty uh, 
in, in, in the statute. It makes for a more compelling case, but it, I, I it may have nothing to do with the actual duty involved. It, I don't, I agree with you. It doesn't have to do with the duty, but I do think it goes to the standard that they have, that the road has to be reasonably safe and convenient. And I do think it's important for the court to understand that, although I absolutely agree, a lot of people choose to live in extremely remote um, areas, this is not a remote area. When the road is open, Mr. Ryla can drive to a convenience store in five minutes. It is not as if he moved out into the middle of nowhere and now is asking the road commission to fix the road for him. And I, I, I do, I do a lot of real property work in all across the UP, and I would venture to say that most of the like camp situations that you're describing here are private roads. Most of those are not documented county roads like this one is. That's that's a that's a critical difference here. Yes, this yes, is a documented and it's undisputed that this is a county road and subject to this statute. And one of the things that we have to think about that maybe the trial court doesn't is how an opinion published or unpublished might be used in the future. And I'm thinking, you know, there's plenty of county roads in floodplains. Uh, one you know, in, in Wayne County, even. There's uh, Heinz Drive that runs along the Rouge River. It's in a floodplain. It's it's used by I don't know how many thousands of drivers a day, but Rouge, the Rouge River floods frequently and makes that road impassable for a week or two at a time throughout the year, not just in the spring, but throughout the year. In Grand Rapids, there's the Grand River, and some folks that live in the lower areas in a particular area are frequently find themselves underwater and sometimes trapped, uh, having little to no access for their children to go to school. And I'm, I'm trying, I'm, you have a very sympathetic case, don't get me wrong, but, I, but one of the things I'm grappling with too is, is, is Wayne County going to be forced to raise the road and Heinz Drive and is Grand Rapids going to be required to re raise or deal with the reoccurring problem that they have in some communities around the Grand River for flooding. Um, and that's where I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the, the it's a, it strikes me as more of a redesign issue. And we'll, I'm sure we're gonna be hearing about Hanson and, and the like. Uh, so my point on, on, on all of this is in terms of the repair and maintain, you know, we have two different, and this might be a better uh, question for the appellee, but there are two different statutes at play, it seems to me. One is under the highway exception where Hansen analyzed the redesign issue and the other one is the one you're appropriately recognizing is the 224-21-2, the shall keep in a reasonable repair. There's a little bit of different language in each of those statutes. I think it's easy to just read them both and say that, say that they're saying the same thing. Maybe, maybe not. But in, in terms of, I think this, this is different than Hansen in the sense that it's a different statute. Right. And I'm trying to figure out whether that just means that we don't look to Hansen because redesign only deals with torts. And this is not a tort. It's a it's a mandamus action. And that's an easy way to simply say it doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you made that argument the same way, but what's your response to what statute? What what duty should we be looking at? Should we be looking at 691 under the under the highway exception? Or should we be looking at 224.21 too, uh, which is the language you used, uh, shall keep in reasonable repair? 224.21 subsection two, your honor. There has not been so far harm. This is not a tort case. And in fact, that's exactly what plaintiff Riley would like to avoid. I mean, he doesn't, we don't want to get to the situation where someone's dying and nobody can get to the hospital and the ambulance can't get to them, we don't wanna end up in a tort case. That's exactly why I'm bringing this case now. 
not as a highway exception case. And I think it's important too. I mean, I'm sure Mr. Penn will discuss Hansen, but the court aptly pointed out, it's a different statute that is not binding in this case. And also in Hansen, there was no dispute about the roadbed. Here, there is a dispute about the roadbed. So that's a factual um, difference between these two cases, as well as um, them falling under entirely separate statutes. So um, Hansen, I, I know Mr. Penn will rely on it. Uh, he briefed it extensively, but I don't think it's really all that applicable here. And even if the court does think so, um, it's important to point out that the Hansen court also stated that um, maintaining what has already been built in a state of reasonable repair so as to be reasonably safe and fit for public vehicular traffic is a basic duty of the road commission. So Hansen, um, you know, was about improving the safety. This is this case is not about improving the safety. Many of those um, tort cases, you know, that's what they're arguing. But this is not about improving the safety. This is about bringing the road to the barest of minimums that it be passable and open, as this court determined they have to be in numerous cases, inclu including the Skogman case. Um, that case is interesting here because um, that is one of the so-called natural accumulation cases, but that case um, had to do with ice and snow. And the court held that in that case, the, the road commission was not liable for the fatality that occurred because the commission was in the act of trying to make the road passable. The difference here is that this commission has made no effort to make the road passable, none. One, one second, Judge Yates. Well, I appreciate your courage in trying to take on the mandamus request because that's about as hard as it gets for us. Um, but what concerns me is the key term seems to be repair. And what you're asking them to do is not restore the road to any perfect or near perfect condition that it was when it was first installed. But instead, you're asking us to dramatically change the road <clears throat> because that's the only way we can solve the problem, right? I mean, I don't think that's necessarily right. Culverts could be installed. A bridge could be installed. And again, the Carver case determined under the precursor to this, to the controlling statute here, that a defect stemming from construction is, is still a defect that, that is, has to be repaired to this standard. So I understand um, the complexities of this case when we start talking about the applicability across the state. But I think one difference here is the reasonably safe piece. Um, my understanding about the uh, geography, basically, of the other um, roads that run along the rivers that you raised is that there are other ways for those residents to, to get out of their homes. But that is not the case here. This Once that happens, once the road is inundated, the Rylas are trapped. They are not leaving and no one is coming in, not even the ambulance, not even a fire truck, not the mail, not the school bus. You said Nobody. it has nothing to do with safety. Those are other cases. So the fact that it's an ambulance or, or fire truck, that goes to safety. So it's just any vehicle can't go down. Correct. Right. right. And, and right. your argument's basically, look, you built this road, all right? If, if you can't handle the river and all that, you shouldn't have built it to begin with. But once having built it, you're under the statutory right. duty to put culverts in or whatever, okay. Yes, your honor, that's 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 essentially the argument. And if it can't be done, then don't build the road. Pardon me? If, if it can't be done correctly, then don't build the road at all. But once having built it, you've got an obligation and a duty to, to comply with the statute. Right, yes. Okay. I interrupted you though, I didn't mean to, if you, if you had more to say there. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on the trial court's error in his ruling that um, he couldn't order mandamus because it would require um, the road commission to expend funds. And uh, that ruling was um, erroneous. Um, courts, of course, can require governmental entities to expend funds. Otherwise, 
the court could never grant relief against a governmental entity. Um, that is clearly not the case. Um, this court um, has numerous occasions required that funding be expended in mandamus cases. In 1977, the court determined that um, in King versus Director of Midland County Department of Social Services, when it ordered the Board of Commissioners to appropriate fund, funds to carry out the services it was mandated to, to perform. And then again in 1980, the court determined in Pontiac Board of Education versus Pontiac um, that a mandamus was proper and ordered the, um, the, the Board of Education to hire and pay school guard crossings. So, um, you know, to the trial court's decision on this um, definitely flies in the face of our jurisprudence and common sense. So I just wanted to make sure I touched on that particular issue because really the trial court only analyzed whether the duty was ministerial and um, his belief that he couldn't order mandamus because it would require the expenditure of funds. Those are really the two issues, the only two issues that his opinion addresses here. Okay. Any other questions? No, oh, thank you. Yeah, for me, okay, thank you. We'll, we'll make, if you don't have time for rebuttal, we'll make sure you get a little extra. This is a complicated case. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. May it please the court, Bill Henn on behalf of the Houghton County Road Commission. Uh, it's very obvious to me that you're familiar with the case and the issues. I'm always more interested in your questions than what I have to say, but I mean, to, to start, I think that there are a couple of different reasons why the circuit court has to be affirmed. I mean, he focused on the ministerial part of it. I think that that kind of overlaps with the duty part of the mandamus requirement because you know the question is, is the duty that is imposed First, you got to say it's cl a clear duty, but then you have to say it's uh, a, a, it's not it, that it is ministerial in the sense that the duty has been defined in the law with such precision that it leaves nothing for the exercise of any judgment. And you know, I think that is such a powerful articulation of you know the the mandamus requirement, and I think it shows why mandamus is an extraordinary remedy and is very rarely granted. And as you would apply it to this case, and I, I think the most obvious reason why the circuit court was correct is that the duty itself has been described, you know, in numerous cases as a very broad general statutory duty. Keep in reasonable repair highways under your jurisdiction. Um, that duty is not so precisely defined that it leaves absolutely no room for the exercise of discretion in executing but isn't that her, duty. But isn't her argument that you have discretion as to what to do, but you have no discretion to do nothing? I think that that is her argument, yeah. but I, I and, think- and what, I, I'm not sure your last comment specifically answered that. Well, the, I was doing nothing. Where mandamus is appropriate is a situation where the duty is defined in the law with such precision that it leaves no room. The duty itself leaves no room for the exercise of discretion. And our position is that fundamentally, the road commission's duty and the state transportation department's duty with respect to highways under its jurisdiction is left to its discretion. It is, you can't divorce the discretion from the duty and the duty itself. I mean, th that's just one sentence in a statute that leads to innumerable possible exercises of discretion in order to, you know, in, in order to fulfill that duty. And so we, we just don't think that this sort of thing, that, uh, that the road commission's duties with respect to repair and maintenance of highways is amenable to mandamus. It's just not the sort of duty that courts have said, yes, you can have this kind of remedy. This is very different than you know, a court issuing, the circuit court here I think had it exactly right, hunting licenses, fishing licenses. You know, if a clerk of a county is presented you know, proof of age and residence and is paid the fee, you get the hunting or fishing license. You know, that, is, that is a duty that is defined in the law with such with such precision that the clerk doesn't have discretion to say, all right, even though you've checked all the boxes, I'm not giving you. 
I, I think it can be ministerial as long as you read the word repair to mean what repair means. It, all it means is take it back to the baseline of where it was. So if it's pockmarked, get it paved properly, right. whatever the case may be. What makes me frustrated with this case is what they're asking for is really not repair. Correct. It's upgrade. Correct. And it's so an I, I could see if they were actually asking to have it repaired, that there could be a ministerial duty. Is that the way that we should look at the case? Well, I, we have certainly made that argument. I think that's an important consideration. And even you know today, I've heard for the first time mentioned, well, they could put culverts in. Now, that's not in the complaint. I don't remember it coming up at uh, the hearing. And, and whether that's true or not, um, that's not a repair. Right, that's that's an improvement. If, if, if safety is the touchstone, you could have a road that was barely used. And then all of a sudden, somebody built up a gigantic, a gigantic subdivision. And now... The argument is, well, you got to grant mandamus because now it's not safe to have a two lane highway. It's got to be a four lane highway. Well, to me, that's that's in no universe of repair. Correct. Well, uh, I would agree with that. I think this also goes to Hanson. I, I know the panel had questions about, well, is it the 1402, the, the 691-1402 duty that applies or the 224-21 duty that applies? I. Yeah, 224.21 is part of the general highway law. It's been around for a long time in various different iterations. The Government Tort Liability Act came along in the late 60s, right? And 691.1402 actually refers to 224.21. It says, you know, the liability procedure and remedies or whatever shall be as provided in 224.21, meaning it, by reference, incorporated those aspects of 224.21, but then 1402 goes on to say, as noted in Naraki and Hansen and a whole lot of Supreme Court cases that we believe are controlling, that the duty itself, not just the liability, not the tort liability, but the duty and the liability that can arise if that duty is breached for uh, county road commissions is limited to the physical structure of the roadbed surface. And then Hansen takes it further and says, it's just repair and maintenance in the sense of restoring to a prior condition, I'd like not improving. I wanted to go back to your, your initial point that you made that this is not amenable to mandamus actions. And I wanna bring you back to the example I used. Sure. I used the example of this not being a flood, but instead a river that washes out the road. When I say washes out, I mean, I said 22 inches, Let's make it 80 feet deep, okay? A stretch of 100 yards, 80 feet deep, woods on both sides, completely impassable. Are you saying even under that circumstance, your client would not have a duty to, to fix or repair, better word, to repair the road because under a mandamus action, because this is not amenable to mandamus, given the nature of the discretion built into the statute. If, if there was an incident like that, if there was a highway washout, and it, it's happened, I mean, sure. it happens, it, they had horrible floods in the UP in Houghton many years ago, uh, you know, billions of dollars of roads that were washed out. Um, so it does happen. The object there, I mean, th that is an ongoing situation that makes the road not, not safe, not passable. Right, so road commissions would endeavor to repair those. I mean, in that case, the, the major floods that happened years ago, it required a lot of federal money to come in. But my point but, is the initial question is whether yeah. it's amenable. You said it's under no circumstances given the lack. So I've given you an absurd right. scenario to tease out from you right. how far you're willing to take that. Because it seems to me that there is a, there is a point where the roadbed itself is damaged, not just potholes, but is damaged to, to right. such of an extent that a duty exists to fix it. Now here, I've already laid my cards on the table. I, I don't think there's, the roadbed has not been compromised. Yeah, Th there is some precedent for this. There's a case that's very close on point. We cited, I believe it's actually exhibit seven to our, uh, our brief, our, our appendix. It's the Inwood case. Um, and that was, I believe, late 90s. And the issue did involve the roadbed. It was an action for mandamus brought by a plaintiff who was seeking to, it was actually the township, seeking to require the road commission to make certain repairs, make certain upgrades to a road to prevent it from rutting 
uh, it, it, they were saying it doesn't drain water properly. So you need to do whatever it takes to, to prevent or to allow the water to drain and that would prevent the rutting. Uh, and the court citing uh, earlier cases like the Wexler case that, that has sort of been on the periphery of these issues said that sort of thing, just because just by nature, the road commission's decision as to when as to how and as to whether you know the duty is actually implicated are so discretionary that it would be a uh, bad precedent for a court to start to dictate to administrative agencies how they make those determinations um, and you know they, they mentioned the budget you know the road commission has a finite budget everybody knows that um, courts historically have stayed out of the business of directing road commissions and other similar government agencies in allocating those funds. Uh, you know, the, I think the common parlance is courts don't appoint themselves as road commissioners when they review these sorts of issues. And I mean, part of the reason for that is that there's political accountability, right? Road commissioners are either appointed by county commissioners or they're elected uh, by the people. And if their decisions generally about whether to fix a Ryla road, you know, or, you know, whether to spend $250,000 or $150,000 to bring in gravel, you know, whether um, that's appropriate given the, the, the larger needs of the entire county, which the road commission has to always keep in mind. Uh, those are decisions that courts typically say, look, this is, these are vested in these political entities uh, and it's not a court's place to use mandamus to um, start to, 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 redefine those roles to start to remake those judgments. Now, <clears throat> all of these arguments, okay, in, in, in the end, when it's all said and done, yep. um, there's a problem here, right? I mean, these people can't get to their house for two, three weeks here. Is it just, they're just out of luck? I think it's, I think it's very clear that the Road Commission has not been unsympathetic towards them. I mean, when, when they made, you know, the, the initial complaints, I think um, Sister Council said, you know, it went back to like 2019. They've lived there since 2010. Um, you know, the, the patriarch, uh, the senior, Mr. Ryla. Uh, and the complaint alleges that this has been happening every year since 2010. But starting about in 2019, they went to the Road Commission, they went to the township, they went to the County Board of Supervisors, and they said, do something about this. Uh, and the road commission was not unsympathetic towards them. It got a quote, right? It, it said, well, and I think the emails are all in the record here. It's a very clear um, sequence of what happened. But, you know, the road commission said, here's what we could do. We could bring in 140000 well, $65,000 worth of gravel. It's not entirely in our control because this is the Sturgeon River. This is a major waterway. Uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has something to say about work that's done, you know, in the floodplain. Eagle has things to say about work that's done in the floodplain. So, I mean, there's other government entities that might say, no, you know, we, we can't allow you to do that. Uh, we're not going to give you a permit. But, you know, if all of that were to fall into place, the Road Commission thought it would cost about $140,000. That presents another problem for the Road Commission because they are restricted under Act 51, which is the Highway Transportation Fund statute, uh, that for improvements to local roads, local township roads, which is what this is classified as, the Road Commission cannot spend more than 50% of the cost of the project using Act 51 funds. So those funds are restricted. The other 50%, and it could be more, depend, some road commissions require 100% funding from other sources, but that has to come from the township. It has to come from a private entity. It could be federal funds. It could be state TDEF grant you know, money. Some other source has to cover 50% of the cost of that improvement. And so the road commission again says to them, well, our hands, our hands are tied. You know, even if we could do this project, even if we wanted to do this project, we have to get permits from Eagle, maybe the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We have to get money. We have to get matching funds from a township uh, or a private individual or some other place just to be able to put the project on our roster. And that's where I believe uh, the plaintiffs went to the county and said, well, you have all these ARPA funds. You know, this was the... Um, uh, the COVID money that came out uh, and that was distributed uh, to a lot of counties. And this particular county decided to 
you know, earmark a certain number of certain amount of funds to all of its townships to use for highway improvements. Uh, I don't I don't remember exactly how much this township got. I think it was 150, 160, 200 thousand dollars, something like that. But the township decided not to allocate any of that money to the Ryla Road improvement. So, you know, again, even if you were to order the road commission to, you know, rid of mandamus to fix this, you know, stop the flooding it's not entirely within their control. You'd have to use other funds unless if the township still refuses. Well, I mean, the road commission can ask the township to pay for it, but the township doesn't have any obligation to say, and you know, the township is making decisions about how it wants to allocate that money across its township roads. And I mean, there are two houses on this road. You know, that's the other thing, you know, it, it dead ends. It, it has, you know, very low volume. And so in terms of, uh, you know, return on the investment, I guess I would say, I think, uh, you know, the township would look at that and say, this money would be better spent on a much busier road. Your, your sympathy is quickly evaporating. For well, <laughs> uh, it's the reality of the situation, right? And, and I, I'm not unsympathetic. I don't think the road commission was unsympathetic, but at some point when these decisions are made, you know, they're left to entities like the township that have tough calls to make. You, you, had, you had mentioned the culverts not being in the complaint. And right. I'll, I'll confess my, my mastery of inverse condemnation law is not all it can be, but do they have a claim for that? Uh, that for your inverse or, condemnation, or actions are, are diminishing the value of their property by having well, a road that's inaccessible. What did the road commission do? I mean, I guess the inverse condemnation would not, it, it has to be direct action directed at the plaintiff's property. I don't believe it can be inaction. I mean, I think they're, they're that, that's my question. That's I think their question. issue here is that, you know, there hasn't been this improvement that's made. I don't think not making an improvement can become an inverse condemnation. At least I, I mean, I, I haven't seen. It. Um, Let me, what, what's your response to appellant's argument that 1402 one, the highway exception, has nothing to do with this case because it doesn't involve a tort. And therefore, Hansen has little or no applicability, the redesign issue. Right. So uh, I would, uh, if, from my perspective, from my perspective only, this seems to be a redesign. But the question is, is why, why does that matter? Because I think uh, the argument is, is that this is, has nothing to do with a tort, so we shouldn't be looking at the highway exception. I don't, uh, first of all, I, uh, I think you have to read the statute the way that, you know, it's written. You have to give it, give the plain language its meaning. 1402 is beyond just liability. It defines the duty. And those are separate concepts. The duty that's imposed to repair and maintain highways is this. And the liability that, you know, can arise from it is limited in a lot of different ways. But I think just a plain reading of 1402, and especially the fact that it, it refers to 224.21, I mean, it sort of incorporates it by reference. Those are, the standards are supposed to be the same. Um, but, you know, I look at Hansen, right? And I, as, as counsel, sister counsel was arguing, um, I looked at Hansen and, you know, I think that th there's a, a sequence there right around page 502, 503, where they're talking about an earlier Court of Appeals case called Wexler v. Wayne County Road Commission. And they quote that case and they say, legislature thus did not purport to demand of governmental agencies having jurisdiction of highways that they improve or enhance existing highways as by widening existing lanes or banking existing curves, that they augment existing highways as by adding left turn lanes or that existing highways be expanded as by adding new travel lanes or extending a highway into new territory. So they're talking about the duty there, right? And this is completely agreed to with uh, in Hansen. They say what the plaintiff sought in this case was to create a duty to design or redesign the roadway to make it safer by eliminating points of special danger or hazard. However, there is no such design duty included in the statute. They're not talking about liability there. They're talking about the duty. What are road commissions required to do by this duty? And they are not required to do any of the things that are listed here in Wexler uh, and in Hansen. And I don't see how that can be divorced you know, from this case just because they're seeking a writ of mandamus and not some sort of tort remedy. I mean, underlying it all is the question of what is the actual duty? You know, mandamus involves a duty. 
tort liability involves a duty. We're arguing here, what's the duty? We know what the duty is. It's in black and white in a lot of cases from the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. And I, I think that that, again, not unsympathetic to the plaintiff, but I think that's where this case fails you know, as a mandamus action. Um, you know, an, uh, one thing I wanna say, I was very surprised to hear about the budget uh, of the Houghton County Road Commission because that's not in the record. Uh, it wasn't at the time the case was decided. It isn't now, it's not in any of the briefs. So I would respectfully submit that, uh, you know, the court shouldn't uh, pay any credence to representations about, you know, whether the Road Commission is flush with cash. For sure, not. the budgetary status of the road commission changes on a day-to-day -day basis for sure for uh absolutely I mean, for it, sure you can't. <laughs> they have to do reports and i'm guessing what council has done maybe has gone to a website or something and pulled off a report that has like a balance statement but you know that doesn't speak to how much of that money is earmarked you know they, they there are projects that are planned years and years in advance so just because you have x amount in your bank account doesn't mean that that's right. all well, you it's know not, liquid it's not in the record anyway, so it's not it is not in the record um uh, Judge um, Judge Kelly, you had mentioned, you know, it, you had asked about the history of the road, and that's not anything that made it into the record either, because this was a very early summary disposition motion, and it was just based on, you know, our position that mandamus was not an appropriate remedy here. In all likelihood, this road was a, it's a high, it has to be a highway by user, because it doesn't run on a straight line. Right, and roads don't have to be built to become highways. The public can just use them under the highway by user statute for 10 years. And if a government entity starts to do maintenance, voila, you have a road. You know, they don't have to build it up. It doesn't have to be designed. It would, I don't know this, it would frankly surprise me if this road was designed by anyone. Um, but, you know, we don't have that in the record either. So I think it's, you know, it's problematic to say, well, if you built it and it was defective, you should be responsible for it. You know, and that didn't really come into play in Hanson either, right? This is the opposite of Hanson. Hanson was a tort liability claim because tragically there was a death that happened, but the argument was this hill is too steep and there's not adequate sight distance over the top. And so the two cars kind of met at the top and road commission, you should have, your duty was to, cut down this slope, right, so, uh, to create greater sight distance. And because you breached that duty, there's now tort liability. This is the opposite case, except there's no tort liability yet. I mean, I, I heard what council said, and I, again, not unsympathetic to the problem, and I don't think the road commission is, or the county or the township is unsympathetic, but, you know, they're asking for the road to be raised. You know, and, and again, the focus is on the duty. What is the road commission's duty? Was there a duty in Hanson prior to the tort liability arising event to cut back the road slope? No. Is there a duty here prior to, you know, any sort of future event to raise the road? No, it has to be the same. Uh, and so again, uh, you know, we, we think that uh, certainly the duty is defined. It's discussed at length in the cases. And based on those binding cases, this court cannot find that there is a, you know, that there is a duty that encompasses what the plaintiffs uh, are trying to obtain through mandamus. And then certainly, even if the duty does include that, it, there's nothing about it that is ministerial. Um, that goes with your such precision art. Argument. Such precision argument, right. I mean, yeah, the, the basic duty, it's defined in cases as a broad general duty. I don't see how any duty that is described as a broad general duty could also at the same time be defined with such precision as to leave no room for the exercise of discretion. I mean, it is just fundamentally not specific enough to lead to mandamus. Um, I do want to make one, uh, one also point, uh, one additional point, which is um, we made a statute of limitations argument, which was uh, that the, the underlying duty here is, uh, I mean, we think the 1402 duty to repair and maintain highways so that they're reasonably safe. MCL 691.1411 says, there's a two year limitation period for claims 
involving defective highways. I mean, now you're trying to reframe their claim for them as a tort claim under the Governmental Tort Liability Act and then pick up its statute of limitations. If they're just seeking mandamus, isn't latches the way to look at it? There is discussion in the mandamus cases about latches, but also they say, um, I, I think latches may be technically the right Right. way but but there's cases that say you shouldn't you, you shouldn't use a writ of mandamus to as a way to accomplish something that would be barred by a statute of limitations if it were brought at law right right but if it were a case. tort claim they'd be seeking recovery of money they're not seeking that at all no i mean it, 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 if it follow me if it went down that road they would essentially be asking that the road commission transfer money to them that they could then use to upgrade the road. And we don't have anything remotely like that. Well, I mean, it, in a sense, I suppose they're asking the road commission to spend money that would benefit them individually rather than the public at large or the count, you know, the, the county residents at large. But a tort claim so typically in a, involves monetary damages and a transfer of funds from the defendant to the plaintiff. That, that, that in no way are they trying to do that. Uh, well, um, I, the, whole po the whole point of putting a statute of limitations on damages actions is that at some point the defendant should be able to move forward and plan without having to worry about financial liability. This is totally different from that. I mean, a writ of mandamus is, is not a legal action. There, there I mean, is a why case. Is, I, I don't understand well, how okay. you could say this is not latches. There, and and I, I understand the court's point. Uh, I would like to point out that there was a fairly recent case called Van Washinova v. Monroe County Road Commission that was similar in the sense that Mr. Van Washinova was seeking a writ of mandamus requiring the Road Commission to make or basically restore a 120-year-old bridge that the Road Commission had actually closed off entirely because uh, the funds weren't available to keep up the repair, which, I mean, that's, that's the other answer to your question is that if there was a washout of the road and the road commission couldn't fix it, they can close the road. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what happened in Van Washinova. He filed uh, for a writ of mandamus saying, no, you have to spend the money to give me a new bridge. This court and judge Cameron, you were on the panel. It's an unpublished decision, but this court relied upon the statute of limitations as a basis to reject that claim because you know, like here, right, Mr. Ryla had been there since 2010. He waited nine years before, you know, he raised this issue with anybody. So there were nine years where he had, you know, flooding issues. And, you know, I think the, the analysis in Van Washinova is similar to the argument we made here, which is that, you know, a mandamus is an equitable action, but it needs to be based on something, based on a duty, right? And the duty here has attached to it a two-year statute of limitations. Well, why doesn't that, it start, as she argues, from, you know, every year there's another flood? That's the argument that they've right. made. And, and our response to that would be, in Michigan, certainly at common law, uh, there is no such thing as the recurring wrongs doctrine. So uh, the case was um, uh, involved a golf course. I'm blanking on the name. We've cited it. But it's, um, it says that in cases of recurring flooding, your, your cause of action accrues the first time you experience damage. And the fact that you have repeated flooding in separate years doesn't restart the statute of limitations. So we would say the analysis would be the same here. That was the Maryland Froling case, Maryland Froling Trust. Maryland what? Maryland Froling, F-R-O-H-L-I-N-G. Yeah. Well, I feel like I've covered a lot. I don't see anything else in my notes here that uh, I had intended to get to. So unless the court has any questions, yeah. we're simply asking that uh, the circuit court be affirmed here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any rebuttal? I, I would like to make just a few comments, Your Honor. Yes. Um, first of all, if the court adopts uh, Mr. Hen's analysis here, a mandamus would, could never, ever be awarded under MCL 224.212. And that is certainly not true. That's not, not allowed here. Um, and furthermore, it, following his analysis, really a road commission doesn't have a duty 
until there's a fatality. If you just sort of mush these two statutes together and say, well, you know, they use some of the same language, so we're just going to throw them together and that's how we're going to analyze this. Um, you know, you end up at a place where the commission really has no duty until there is a fatality. And that clearly is not what the legislature intended when they ordered that roads be kept in repair in a state that is reasonably safe. That's definitely not the legislative intent here. And I just wanna to touch briefly on this issue of the statute of limitations and latches. Um, the, the new case, the Van, um, Van, Van, Van Washanova case, um, that's very different. In that case, the Road Commission had actually uh, officially abandoned those bridges and that was the act that was being um, that was that was the triggering act there. In this case, the Road Commission has there is not a set moment in time other than each spring when my clients are again trapped in their home um, that that something happens to to trigger the statute of limitations, if that even is the right thing to be talking about. And I don't think it is. And Going on to the latches argument, uh, latches is relevant when one party is in a worse position than it would have been uh, had 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 the claim been brought sooner. And this is uh, in the Michigan Supreme Court case Walker v. Schultz. And that is not the case here. The Road Commission is in no worse of a situation now than if Mr. Ryla had raised this issue in 2010. And furthermore, it's not in the record, and I uh, apologize about that. But he did; he has been raising this issue prior in discussions with the road members of the road commission. So it's not as if he did nothing for nine years. That is not what happened here. Thank you, Your Honors. If you have additional questions, I'd be happy to try to address them. No, we don't. Thank you very much. You. Uh, interesting case, well argued. Thank you both. Thank you. Matter is submitted. You're welcome. Matter is submitted. Turning now to item number 10. It's a consolidated case, Opera Block Properties, Inc. versus Auto Owners Insurance, 365213 and 365215. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Kurt Kilman. I'm here on behalf of the appellant auto owners insurance company in matter 365213. <laughs> and um, I've been pairing my notes over the last couple of hours to try to really uh, uh, reduce the time that I spend here with you. I know you've looked through a lot. There's hundreds of pages of deposition transcripts and policies and uh, lots of interesting reading. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, at least from my client's perspective, is that this is a very limited issue case. You know that this involves, <coughs> pardon me, involves an issue regarding uh, damage and destruction of property at the Opera Block Properties in Portland, Michigan, back in 2019. And um, I'm going to spend my minutes with you today uh, talking about the sort of delicate and intricate factual scenario about how this case arose. I mean, facts are always important, but in this case, especially from my client's position, the facts, uh, especially surrounding the loss and when it occurred and what was covered are especially important. Um, it's our position that, um, and, and maybe just a little bit of background, Opera Block Properties uh, are, is a, a three buildings on the, on the river in downtown Portland. Uh, all owned and uh, by uh, Mr. Fuller, who's the owner of Opera Block. Uh, he had been insured with uh, my client auto owners, I think beginning back in 2017 uh, under general uh, liability policies. And those policies, as they were originally issued, uh, did not contain coverage for damage caused by water backup through the basements or through drains. 
this is a this is a, a common uh, problem. It's a common issue in commercial policies and in residential policies. And under most policies, unless you purchase specific coverage, you don't get it. I learned it the hard way at my home a few years ago. And now my wife reminds me every time we come around that we make sure that we have the water backup coverage. And there's no dispute about that from any of the parties here. There's no dispute from the agent. There's no dispute from Opera Black. Those original part that those original policies excluded that coverage. Well, can I ask you a question? And yes. I, I don't mean to get ahead of your argument, but to me, this whole case seems to come down to how much authority, if any, Lydia McCauley had to bind your client. Because if, if she could bind them, then I think you've got a real problem. If she can't bind them, then I think you're in good shape. Well, and and that that's yes, that, that is an issue, Honor, and I'm going to get to it, and I'm happy to address it now. Lydia McCauley is the agent who works for Keebler, who is servicing this account. Uh, they have a, an agency agreement with auto owners that that uh, authorizes, uh, like it does with many of its insurance agents, the right to uh, market and sell the policies. Yeah, I mean they're not captive; they're an independent they're not agent. Captive, correct? But, correct. They sell a lot of different products. Right. 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 But. But as but, I understand the record, she could bind auto owners, and if she could, then there's a problem. Yeah. Well, she 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 could she could buy she could buy auto owners under under policies and under the agent's agreement policies that comply with the policies of auto owners and the policies that must comply with with Michigan law, any law that would apply to it. And in this case, uh, the point that that I am making is is that the property at Opera Black, which was the subject of this claim was destroyed before any reasonable argument can be made that coverage was bound. But just to be clear about this though, McCauley meets with Fuller before nine o'clock in the morning on February 5th and the flood occurs on February, the backup occurs on February 6th, right? Now, That's now, now what happened between Fuller and McCauley may be a matter of some dispute, but- right. it, the first time we know there's a lot of water in there is in the early morning hours of February 6th, right? Well, I would argue, as I did, that the, our, the water was noticed the day before on the 5th. I mean, that's just a tiny amount of water. Yeah. I mean, well, it was, it was sufficient enough that he, he testified he had to vacuum it out and pump it out, which means he didn't take the sponge and he didn't take the handy wipes and do it. Uh, so, <laughs> so to me, I might disagree with, with the nature and extent, but yes. The biblical, the biblical flooding came in the early morning hours of, of February 6th. That's the loss. That's the loss. That's the loss according to Mr. Fuller, mm -hmm. according to his video, according to his sworn statements and proof of loss that he submitted. Okay. You, you said a minute ago it was destroyed before it was bound. I mean, yes. the, the mopping up isn't quite... Even if it's more than a paper towel, right. that that's not quite destroyed at that. No, point. no, I, I would agree with that. But but to me, that that would, and I, I don't know that we ever got into these issues. That would probably be the continuation of this is a this was not a heavy rainstorm. This was the the river rising because an ice flow broke, and I mean it was it was flooding the entire town. Pardon, I shouldn't even confess this, but where where is where is Portland? Portland is between here and Lansing. Uh, it's. Uh, uh, Exit. It's the bedroom community for couples where one works in Grand Rapids and one works. Yes, in uh, not too far from Grand Ledge. It's on the north side of I-96. It has both a McDonald's and a Burke. <laughs> I've been to the McDonald's there many times on the way back and to and from school. I, I live in a county that doesn't have a single fast food restaurant. So <laughs> I'm, God bless I'm you. I'm, sticks. I'm working to get there someday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, that, uh, that Judge Yates's uh, question is a good one and will probably save some time to slick. Yes. So in the in the days before the loss, shall we say, there are communications going on between Lydia McCauley, the agency, and Mr. Fuller. Mr. Fuller testifies, I want more insurance. I want the best of the best. I want the creme de la creme. And I want to, to max this place out. And uh, I think that Ms. McCauley uh, uh, concurred for that or, or concurred with that. Uh, although, and I'm going to move along here to to some of the uh to the facts she uh, and although she testified they were talking about it there's really no there's really no uh good argument that somehow this coverage could have been bound on the fifth okay because we know that the first request that was sent by keebler to auto owners 
was six hours or seven hours after the biblical flooding was, was photographed or was recorded by, uh, by Mr. Uh, Fuller going in there. Right, but, but their success depends entirely upon Macaulay's authority to bind auto owners without having to communicate with auto owners. Right, right. But if you look at Macaulay's testimony, she says specifically she didn't bind it that day because she, uh, she, um, get through my thing. She backdated the right. <clears throat> to she when the conversation it. was, correct? Right. They were having, they were having conversation, but she testifies that on February 5th, the day before that the, that she specifically told opera block that coverage was not bound. And the reason it wasn't bound was because although we've been talking about the water backup here, he was requesting a lot of stuff. He was requesting uh, increase on the building limits for the destroyed building. He wanted, I think, up to $175,000 on one of the um, buildings. Uh, <laughs> she, he had done some remodeling on these buildings. And so this, this, this uh, water backup coverage that he was gonna get was part of this super duper uh, uh, package plus that you can get, which gives you the water backup, it gives you increased limits on loss of income or whatever else might be under there. But he was also asking for additional coverage for the value on it. And she sends him an email. She sends him an email <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna read it. Uh, it's uh, the appellee's brief, page nine. She sends an email to Mr. Fuller on February 5th, 2019 at 9.03 a.m. She says, dear Tim, I am working on changing the policy for Opera Block and noticed that you wrote on the back of the policy deck that you want $175,000 on the building and that is where Vintage and the new dance studio is. But how much square footage is that 140 Kent Street location? Question mark. What has been done other than the tanning parlor and the drywall upstairs? Question mark. I know that the company will ask this let me know, thank you, ASAP. I don't know how any reasonable conclusion of that statement could say that coverage was bound on that day. But let me take you to her deposition, question and answer. And from your perspective, when as, again, as an auto owner's appointed agent and producer, from your perspective, when Mr. Fuller left your office on February 5th, 2019, he had that change request from your perspective was effective, was active, right? Yes. That's her. Right. But I, but I, what I think she's saying is, look, I, mean, I can't bind this without the information I need, the, the square footage or what's there. The underwriting department is going to want to know this because, I mean, if, if, if that, if she just has the unlicensed authority to say, I'll, you know, I'll give you $10 million worth of coverage and then finds out that the underwriting, of course, would never do that. That's, that's not coverage. That's not correct. Right, right. But she was specifically asked. From your perspective, that change request, from your perspective, was effective, was active, right? And that's on February 5th. And she says, yes. I mean, what does she mean if she doesn't mean that the coverage had changed? It had been stepped up to the, as you say, and the record says, super duper policy. Well, I mean, it's it's that that line is, is again, I think, specifically uh, against where where she told uh, what she told them in addition on that day that she tried to do a change request, but she wasn't able to complete it. So, so maybe she thought at the time, but, but and I, in my mind, that did not go. And in my mind, that coverage was bound at the very earliest on the following morning, the 6th at 10, 11 a.m. And at the right. latest, right. some There's days no later. question when she has her communication on the 6th with auto owners, the backups occurred already. No doubt about that. Right, right. And I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, and as she also testified in her deposition on the I think this is on the appendix 288 or 299. I'm not sure, Judge, where you were referring to. But uh, she told Fuller that she could not bind coverage because she needed more information. Right. Okay. So, of course, that I think, obviously, and you, you identify the, the crux of the issue here because, and I don't think, you know, I think when I'm taking a look at this, that a lot of this is, is insurance law 101. You can't insure a sinking ship. This endorsement that we've spent... I don't know how much time and effort and God knows how much money locking about. There's nothing wrong with this endorsement. The endorsement only covers, however, property that, property that wasn't destroyed when it became. So uh, yes, if, uh, if the coverage is bound before then, uh, then the coverage is there. 
I don't think the facts show it. I think, um, not that I really totally understood Judge Krieger and her ruling. Um, it was, a, it was a, a little uh, unclear to me, but I think she sort of, uh, without uh, going too much analysis, uh, just found that the endorsement, that the coverage had been bound on the 15th. She didn't cite any factual support for that. And then found that says, well, basically, uh, while the endorsement, uh, it's retroactive back to the fifth, so what does it matter anyway? And my point to that is, is that, well, even if it's retroactive, and sometimes companies do for various reasons, it doesn't resurrect the fact that this, that doesn't take the uninsurable property and resurrect it into insurable property. Did she have the authority to, to backdate it and, and find it? Uh, I, I believe that Ms. Uh, it, right, if she's if she's telling you've got coverage and she's did it, yes. As I understand it, the uh, she was allowed to backdate, and I'm sure Mr. Hamawi has knows it exactly, but 17 or 18 days. There, there's a procedure that that coverage can be backdated. I mean, th that that's the issue I'm I'm wrestling with. I mean, I had a case last month where somebody wanted to change some coverages, and the company said we have to do an investigation. So they came on, they said, well, you know, we're, we're not going to do that. So we're not going to bind it. But here we have an agent with authority to bind. And she might have looked out and saw ice flow coming down. Well, you better bind this pretty quick because, you know, all hell's going to break loose here. You call it a biblical flood. But if she bound it, I mean, she bound it. I mean, it, it, it just seems to me that she has the authority to do it, whether it was wise, whether it was proper, whatever. If she did it, game over. Right. But, but that authority could never include the ability to include property that was already damaged or destroyed. Because you I think- saying destroyed, but if it goes back that next day, I mean, it's not destroyed if there's a little bit of water in there. No, but on the six, where I'm claiming that coverage has not been bound, when he's there in the middle of the, of the morning and the place is now chest high with water. Okay. Um, but, but I thought we'd be talking about her back to, to the day before, which she had authority to do, is that- Right, but, but the analysis of this court has to be if you're looking at this, whether or not there's a loss in progress, you don't look, you have to look, I think, and what the case law says, you have to look when that coverage was applied for and bound. So at the moment she, at the moment that, that, that she decided to apply for that coverage to auto owners, which I think she's doing at that time as an, as an agent of Mr. Uh, Fuller, or when it's ultimately issued, that's what it is. At that moment, is, is the property insurable or not? So you're saying she did not have the authority to backdate it? She had the authority to backdate it, but it only it would only cover property that was insurable at the time. So if we say that she bound the coverage at on the 6th of February at 10, 11 a.m., she can backdate it, but it will only cover property that was insurable as of February 6th at 10, 11 a.m. And, and my point is, is that property is destroyed or in the process of being destroyed at that time. So therefore- What's the point of backdating it? Well, there's, all, there's other coverage that they may have wanted. The, the, the endorsement is still good. It covers a lot of stuff. And so it, it's there to cover maybe uh, the place burns down and now he wants 175 grand instead of the 150 it was at, or he has an employee dishonesty claim or something along that line. So I think that's why, I and I'm, I'm not an expert in backdating that, but that's what was explained to me. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so I think it's, it's clear. I think you have to look at when the request was made, what was insurable. A lot of it was, but the subject of this wasn't. Um, so I, that really, it, we've taken now, and you've brought me through, thankfully, a lot of these arguments. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions uh, okay. or anything like that. I'm happy to try to answer them, uh, but uh, otherwise, thank you. Okay, thank right. you. Uh, we do have one attorney who I understand is remote. Oh, is is okay. he with us? Um, is he planning on making an argument? Do either of you know, Mr. Schutza? He did file a brief. I he did, did file a brief, also supporting. Uh, all right. Well, um, uh, have you decided how you're sharing your time with him? Is he arguing? He's, he's, he may just answer okay. some questions. All right. That's very good. Go right ahead then. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Rabi Hamawi, and I represent the 
appellee, cross uh, appellant in this case. And as you, you know, I, I just want to try to uh, keep my time to the points that has been made by the, uh, by the appellant in this case. The uh, factual basis and the factual history of this case is very clear. And I think there are very, two very important points that the court has to focus on to reach the correct result and to affirm the lower court's decision, which I think made also the correct determination. And the reason why the court wanna do that, I think uh, that something goes to your uh, honor, uh, Judge Cameron point, is how can a published or unpublished opinion be used in other cases in the state of Michigan? And the focus is going to be really on what authority did, what type of authority did this agent has when it was communicating with Mr. Fuller? There is no question that on February 5th, before 9.03 a.m., Mr. Fuller came to the agent's office, that's the, and the that's auto owner's insurance agency office, and she took the information from him and she bound that request, and that request is bound. There is an agency contract, Your Honor, in this case that's been submitted to the courts under a protective order. You have a copy of it, and it was also filed in the lower court. That agency contract gives the auto owner's agent the authority, number one, to bind changes to her policies. Not only that, it also gives the agent the authority to backdate the changes up to 20 days. That is very important because if we look at the testimony in this case of Ms. McCauley, and um, the, the testimony focus on something that Judge, uh, Judge Yates said, when he left, when Mr. Fuller left the office on February 5, 2019, before 9.03 a.m., from your perspective, was this coverage bound? Answer, yes. The coverage was bound. And then, he, I'm sorry, that was which day? That's February 5, 2019, before 9.03 a.m. He thinks it's bound then. She, she says it's and, bound. And she is bound. She, she says, says it's it bound. backdated? This is the date that the endorsement was effective, February 5, 2019. Now, on February 6, at 10, 11 a.m., that's when she sends the email to auto owners and by the way, the email starts with the very important two words, starts with effective February 5, 2019. Why? Because she is, for, for the purpose of that binding, she is an agent of auto owners for that limited contractual relationship. She is an agent of auto owners. There is an agency contract. There is also that agency contract gives her the ability to do what? to actually bind auto owners. But just to be clear, yes. I mean, she's an independent agent. She's not a captive agent, but what you're suggesting is under Michigan law, an independent agent by virtue of a contractual agreement with an insurer can have the authority to bind the insurer. So in this case, Your Honor, I understand it's an independent agent. By the way, I was an independent agent myself right. for about 14 years. Right. I represented auto owners at one point of time. I had contracts with a lot of other companies. In this case, it's not only the agency contract, it's also the testimony of the commercial underwriter, Mr. Jeff Mack. Right, right. That he that even concedes that she can he, do He it. concedes that. But I think that is, and this is, by the way, this is a concept that's recognized under Michigan law. It's the dual agency concept. Mm -hmm. The dual agency concept, an agency could be created apparent, either express or implied, or, or uh, uh, express or implied, or it could be apparent, apparent by virtue of the deeds, of the words that the agent. I mean, Judge, Judge Kelly, you were talking about the McDonald example, uh, McDonald effect, I think I heard you say that. And uh, I know there was mentioning about fast food. Think about this way. You get to McDonald's, you have in the drive-thru, you and your passenger, and there are three people on the back, and you order five quarter pounders. You said, I want five buns and five patties in them. And you are still at the teller, you're still talking to the teller. And the teller goes over your order again, says, is there anything else, sir? No. So now you take away, take off with your car, 
because you want to go to the cashier to pay. From your perspective, from the teller's perspective, that order is complete. Now, maybe you don't pay for it yet because you are not at the cashier yet, but, and that's when at the cashier, he may ask you, do you want some mustard, some ketchup? But the order was complete once you ended that brief stop at the teller. And you know, I was listening to your honor, to everybody very, very carefully today. And I wanted to make sure I address this. Maybe that's why I'm hungry also. Well, no, but it, it seems to me that it's a bilateral conversation on the morning of February 5th. Yes. Fuller says, I thought the change had been made. Macaulay says, I thought the change had been made. So auto owners really has no way to get inside the fact that those two have agreed about it. The only way they get out of it is if she did not, as a matter of law, have the authority to bind auto owners. That, that's how I size up this case. Am I wrong about that? Well, I think, I think you are absolutely correct, Your Honor. And I think the other, the, the other, the other point, and Jeff Mack talks about, talks about it, and I, I deposed him for seven hours for Jeff Mack, and I enjoyed deposing him because I was, as I said, I'm the insurance business myself. I was an agent before I became a full-time attorney. I asked him, from, tell me, this is what I asked him specifically, how do you define binding authority? And he says, in his response to me, he says, Binding authority is giving the agent the ability to bind coverage before us reviewing it. I think otherwise, otherwise, why would we have binding authority? This morning, Your Honor, on the way here from Southfield, driving on 96, I saw at least three huge billboards with the auto owner sign that the auto owner's name is, is shouting at you. And I thought about it. If, if I, let's say I have a policy with auto owners, I call the agent, I say, hey, listen, go ahead, please add comprehensive to my liability only policy. And the agent says, Mr. Hamari, done. Now, maybe I don't get the certificate until two, three, four, five days later, but that does not change the fact that that conversation, the agent gave me, gave me a binder. And the Michigan case law is clear and the, uh, the Bobian versus, state auto versus Bobian is the, the major case on this, that binders could be oval. They don't have obviously to be, to be in writing. So the reason why this is important, because that goes, Judge Cameron, to a point that you made, how does a published or unpublished decision in this case makes, makes, makes you know, effect, make, make a, an influence on people's doing business in the state of Michigan? If the court finds that no, that inter the binding authority means nothing, the 20 day backdating means nothing, then this means now we cannot do any business whatsoever until we have to wait until we actually get the endorsement five, six, seven, eight, nine days, 10 days I later. I think, and, and clear this up for me, yes. because it kind of became clear that the most thought provoking or significant thing I think he said, if I understood the argument, and maybe I didn't pick this up in the briefs, is this. Okay, fair enough. This agent can bind auto orders. Nobody's questioned about that. This agent can backdate it, okay? But you can't backdate or bind for a loss that's already occurred. And by the time she backdated it on the 6th, the loss was occurring. And so I can backdate and bind the rest of the policy for fire, somebody breaks a window, whatever, but for this particular loss being the flood from the ice in the river, because at the time of the backdating, the loss had already occurred, I can't, legally there can't be coverage for that. If, if, now, maybe I didn't understand that argument, but if, if that is what the argument is, what do you say to that? The, the uh, a couple of points, this is a very, very great, uh, uh, you know, uh, the remark and very good that you noticed this, Your Honor. From our perspective, and this is what the trial court judge, and this is what all the evidence, including the testimony of Mr. Jeff Mack, the binder took place on February 5, 2019, before 9 or 3 a.m., before Mr. Fuller had actually walked off the property, because that's when, from her perspective, from his perspective, and from Jeff Mack's perspective, that's when the binder took place. February 5, 2019, before 9 or 3 a.m., when the loss eventually happened on February 6, 2019, at 3.49 a.m., 
the coverage was already bound. I actually asked Mr. Mack this, Your Honor. I said, because there was an argument about the square footage of one of the buildings. I asked him, the fact that you do not have the square footage, what, what, does it change the fact that coverage was bound? And he said, no, this is a mere technicality for us to complete the processing of the endorsement. And that's why the endorsement, when it was issued, it was issued effective February 5, 2019 at 12.01 a.m. Because that is the time. That's the very important point about when the binder took place. And that's why I don't want uh, Mr. Kill Mr. Kilman's argument to muddy the water, so to speak, no pun intended. I think, I think the timeline is, is clear. And although he may create some, some, some type of confusion about what really happened, I think the facts are, are clear. February 5, 2019, 9.03 a.m. That's when there was the order. I know the, the, uh, the briefs mentioned order taker. Remember my example, the McDonald's example. Once you, you talk to the teller and you leave, that's when your order is complete. Now, maybe you don't pick up your order until, until a few minutes later, but that does not change the timing for your order. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Schultz joined us. Um, did you have any argument at all? I want to make sure because you only have about six or seven more minutes, and I'm not sure if you have did, spoken with um, uh, counsel and how you're sharing time if you are going to speak. Well, I, I would agree with virtually everything uh, counsel for Opera Block just said, but I would also add, I, in my research, I found a case. One, well, let me uh, do this. Let me do this. Let me, let me let me do this before. Let me interrupt you for a moment. Did you have anything further? I don't. I, Just a couple of, of quick points, Your Honor. I, or you're you're cutting in. Okay, I'm I'm, your, go, I'm going your, to make it very very quick. I know, in Mr. Mr. Kilman, he mentions that Ms. McCauley notified Mr. Fuller that she could not bind the coverage at that time, and he cites page seventy of her deposition. I pulled page 70 of her deposition and I actually compared them and I asked her to do the same thing, Your Honor, and that's just not, not accurate based on the record. The record is when he left her office that morning, which is the morning of February 5, coverage was bound. The last thing I want to mention, there is an identic, factually identical case, which is the Meridian case, and this is, I understand it's an unpublished a case from the Michigan Court of Appeals, it's not binding on this court, but I think this is very uh, instructive and, and persuasive because in that case, the fire happened. So the, the insured came to the, to the agent's office. The agent said, coverage bound. He, go, he leaves. The, the fire happens overnight. The agent doesn't send the fax at that time. We're still doing faxes. The fax wasn't sent until the next morning. And the court in that case, the Court of Appeals, I understand, again, it's unpublished, but the court in that case said that there was a binder when the agent made assurances to the insured that coverage was bound. The fact that fax wasn't sent until the next day does not change the outcome. And for these reasons, Your Honor, I ask you to uh, affirm the lower court's decision regarding the uh, regarding the motion for summary disposition. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Schutz, you've got about four minutes. Go right ahead. All right. Thank you, John Schutza on behalf of the Keebler Agency to follow up on that last point raised by Brother Counsel. Now, this court back in 1974 in the State Auto Mutual Insurance Company versus Badcock case said a binder may be written or oral and be founded on the words and deeds of the agent. There's no question. The case that I found closest of this court, I thought to, to this scenario was the 1990. Jackson versus Transamerica Corporation case, uh, where, the, where the carrier in that case basically tried to do the same thing that auto owners is attempting to achieve in this case. And the same attempt to escape coverage was unsuccessfully uh, uh, in that case as it is here. The fact that auto owners didn't receive the requested change in coverage until after Opera Block's losses doesn't permit it to disavow its contractual obligation to provide the coverage put in place by Ms. McCauley of our agency. And then finally, a, a point unique to me, uh, Auto Owners contends that McCauley was acting as uh, the agent of the agency when she bound water backup coverage. That's simply not true. And it doesn't take into account the concept of dual agency, which has been applied uh, to this type of rela relationship. No less 
an authority than the, probably the most learned insurance, insurance treatise, Couch, says an agent license to sell insurance products for a variety of insurers as an independent insurance agent may still be considered an agent of an insurer if the insurer has a written agency appointment agreement expressly authorizing the agent to transact the business on behalf of the insurer, insurer as its agent. That's precisely what we have here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any rebuttal? Uh, just very briefly, thank you. I asked the question about the court to reread the testimony and the documents of, of Liddy McCauley because um, the the first line of the email that she sent on February 5th says, I'm working on changing the policy. To me, that means that the policy hasn't been changed, that she hasn't bound the coverage. Um, he's got no written email or anything like that. And if, if that is not consistent with her policy uh, or with her, her testimony and the other evidence, uh, then at least we have a maybe we need a trial on this matter but uh, other than that unless you have any other questions thank you very much no, i don't see all right, all right thank, thank you thank you uh, all the matter is submitted now turning to item number 11 blasdell versus blasdell 365298 Thank you. All right, go right ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Heather Nally appearing on behalf of Mr. Kevin Gentry. Uh, we would ask that you allow me to stand in for this argument. I appreciate the opportunity to argue this matter before the court and after having watched your long day, I certainly will do everything I can to make this quick and sweet. Uh, frankly, uh, this court uh, obviously knows the standards of review with regard to sparks and the factual findings for clear error, dispositional rulings for fairness and equity under Welling. And what's most important to my argument, your honors, would be the Sands case, which requires affirming unless, as is here, the court is left with a firm conviction that the decision was inequitable. Um, in this case, your honor, the main issues that I think are important are the retirement accounts and the marital debt. The fact of the matter is, is that this court uh, had a goal, I'm sorry, the trial court had a goal for fairness and equity under Janssen to make a trial uh, division of property that is roughly congruent. And if not, then the trial court must explain why. What is important for this court to note is that the inequity falls heavily upon uh, the issue with regard to the debt. Hey, so can, I ask you, can I ask you about that for a second? Because the way it looks to me, the debts followed the assets. Your client got more of the assets, so the debts went along with those assets. He can sell off the assets if he wants to clear the debt. And the only transfer that took place was um, his ex-wife transferred $50,000 to him from her retirement account. I don't see how that could possibly be inequitable. Your Honor, the first thing I would note with regard to that is the solar panel. So that's the exact opposite of what you just indicated. What you indicated was that in this case, somebody could just sell an asset and then get themselves out of that debt. My client in particular here has a debt that is attached to the marital home. So if he were to sell that marital home, the debt is all by itself in his hands. So the debt is attached to the marital home, but if the marital home sells, he would keep that. That well, presum debt presumably, presumably the, the solar panels would increase the value of the house. You would think that, except for the fact that the solar panels are already included in the value of the house and the debt is laying out there separate on its own. So there is an appraisal in this matter. And in fact, uh, our client was given $63,291 as equity with regard to the home, but that already included the solar panels. 
The debt with regard to those solar panels does not in fact attach to the home. That is separate in the amount of $28,780. So who, again- who, Whose decision was it to put the solar panels on the house? It was both of their decisions. If you review back to the transcript, you would note that uh, both parties uh, appeared on the loan documents and both parties were aware of the situation with regard to the solar panels. In fact, in this case, the plaintiff may have not thought that the solar panels were going to give them the amount of bang for their buck, but she did agree with the purchase and they did attach to the house. Right, but it, it'd be a wonderful world if it, going through a divorce, you could get all the assets and settle your ex-spouse with all the debt. I, I just don't understand how it's wrong or inequitable to say, if you get the house and you get the solar panels that go with the house, you don't take the debt that goes with the house and the debt that goes with the solar panels. Well, again, number one, I would indicate that the debt isn't balanced with any kind of equity with regard to the solar panels. It is completely separate. There is also a debt associated with the house, the mortgage, and that also goes with the house. So he's gaining both of those with only the equity in one of those assets. The other thing that is important with uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I would hope this court would take into account with regard to equity, is the fact that the plaintiff in this case gets to walk away with a fresh start. She has most of her pension, a lot of retirement, and absolutely no debt. That's a big deal. She also has the earning capacity in this case. Whereas our client walks away saddled with very little retirement, almost, uh, I think about a third uh, compared to what plaintiff will have in her retirement, and also walks away with all of the debt, including the debt that goes with the home and that unsecured debt uh, in the amount of $37,249, as well as that additional solar panels debt. So in the end, the plaintiff walks away with a fresh start and the defendant walks away digging out of a hole. That can hardly be seen as equitable. And frankly, when you look at the numbers in this case, the amount of the property that the plaintiff walks away with is 63.11%. The amount that our client walks away with after you associate and saddle the debt in comparison to his benefit of the equity is 64,669, which is 36.89% of the total. So the equity comes in my my book, the equity comes in the fact that she also gets to start this life out free and clear, while in fact the defendant has to work to pay off all of those debts before he gets to step a day into the clear. That cannot be seen as equitable. And also under Jansen, a, a split such as the 63.11% and 36.89% can hardly be seen as roughly congruent. There's no sense in that being equitable. Your Honor, I understand that everybody has had an awful long day, and certainly this is not the most exciting argument at the end of that long day. So I would just indicate that with regard to the appellant's, uh, appellee's chart on page five in their brief, uh, none of that appears to be found in the record. What I would indicate as well is plainly it just appears to be a math in the making on the sheet of the paper. Uh, what is not found in that chart on page five is interestingly enough the debt associated with those solar panels which really makes this offset considerably if you have any further questions i would absolutely be available for them thank you for your time today i understand again that it's been very long okay i think we're all set thank you very much Dawson. thank you your honors um may it please the court my name is danielle dawson i am appearing today on behalf of the plaintiff plaintiff appellee um, in addressing the issues that opposing counsel has already raised, um, the trial, so the first argument is the trial court's division of the marital asset, which uh, has already been touched upon. But in our response, there's a table that is included. And at no point during the trial did defendant ever provide any argument or evidence regarding the values of the marital assets and the debts that he disagreed with those. Um, further, as you probably read in our summary, both parties agreed um, at trial on the record that um, the solar panel, the valuation of the solar panels was at zero because of the debt, but also offset by the valuation. So it's improper for the defendant appellant to arbitrarily change the value of this asset now after already agreeing to the net value of zero at trial simply for the purpose of this appeal. Um, 
And then also when you factor in the amount of the personal property that defendant received, which is approximately 23,755, when you put the, that together with the solar panels and look at it in terms of percentages, um, the defendant appellant was awarded 51% of the value of the marital assets, while the plaintiff appellee, my client, was only awarded 49%. So as such, defendant appellant has no grounds to claim that the trial court's award was inequitable. Well, um, it, it looks to me like your client walked away with no assets, not anywhere near as much debt as he has, but she had to pay him $50,000 on her way out the door. Is that correct? About how this all went down? Correct. Um, and it, Kind of bringing me to my final argument is the fact that admittedly defendant went on somewhat of a spending spree towards the end of their marriage and um, relying on um, my apologies here. Relying on Woodington um, where this court actually ruled that the party that has dissipated marital assets without the fault of the other spouse, that value of the dissipated assets may be included in the marital estate. Our client um, did not necessarily, in the interest of fairness, she only asked that the court take into consideration his spending habits. And so in doing so, um, that is how the court came to their calculation and their division. Um, it was clearly stated that um, the court clearly stated that it was not equitable to divide the, the party's debts 50-50 when the defendant appellant spent enormous sums of money um, and un un unnecessary frivolous, frivolous items and separately incurred substantial amounts of marital debt which is what led the court to divide the assets and the debts in the manner in which they did. So we would respectfully request um, that the trial court's ruling and division be upheld as it is not erroneous. So any questions? Thank you. Any rebuttal? Uh, Your Honor, again, we would just ask that you would uh, take a look at the fact that the uh, uh, solar panels, again, uh, were not included with regard to a net value because they are not a value in and of themselves. They're an attachment to the home that was included with the appraisal of the home, but they carry a separate debt in and of themselves. So they are a negative value, not a positive value. And that is what our client tried to get the trial court to understand, number one. And number two, uh, with regard to uh, the roughly congruentness, again, we would ask you to go back through the actual trial court's findings and look at the math with, again, to, uh, with regard to what the trial court found. Uh, unfortunately, we do not agree with the math, and it is something that the two attorneys uh, have a different viewpoint on. But uh, frankly, it does appear that with regard to the retirement, the home, the Polaris, and the escape, that our client does appear to look like he walks away with approximately $3,000 more. But when you add in the debt, including those solar panels, which have almost a $30,000 debt on that side, that does change the numbers considerably. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you uh, both very much. That matter is submitted. Turning now Thank to you. item number 12, in Ray guardianship of EAHC, that's item number 369381. Good afternoon, your honors. May it please the court. My name is Brad Maurer. I represent the appellant, Carlos Humberto Zero Salazar. Um, appellant is asking this court to reverse the trial court's erroneous conclusion of law that the appointment of a temporary minor guardian does not constitute dependency and or placement for the purposes of the federal special immigrant juvenile or SIJ statute. Can I ask you a question? Yes. I've been wanting to ask you this for weeks. This is one of the first cases I read for this sitting. So 
differentiating between a juvenile guardianship on the one hand and a minor guardianship on the other. We're talking about a minor guardianship here. Yes. Where is the authority under Michigan law that a minor guardianship can extend beyond the age of 18? Statute, court rule, case, anything. Don't, don't cite federal law. No, correct. I, I don't have any authority that a guardianship would extend beyond the age of 18. And in fact, the proposed order that we've provided this court here makes clear that the guardianship order did terminate here based on the minor in question turning 18. OK, so so stop for just a second. Sure. There's no doubt you filed this case in time to get your findings. There's no question that the temporary order appointing the guardian as a temporary guardian vested the court with jurisdiction to make the SIJ findings. But the, the court refused to do so. And didn't the window close when the child turned 18? I mean, I'm sympathetic, but I just don't understand how we could send this back and say now that the child's beyond 18 and can not be in a minor guardianship. Now you have to make the findings. So you mean the window closed to make the SI, to issue the SIJ Correct, findings? Right, because right. Because the so, guardianship ended. Yes, the guardianship ended. But the, the good news for the minor in question here is that a, an order such as the or, a guardianship order that makes the minor dependent on the court, the fact that it terminates based on age, that order is still a qualifying order that can be used to then petition for special immigrant juvenile status with USCIS, the federal immigration authorities. So they're, they're sort of separate, right? There's, there are these, there's the, the exercise of jurisdiction initially is the ordering of the guardianship, right? The granting of the guardianship. Right. The, the order appointing the temporary guardian in mid November yes. satisfies the jurisdictional requirement and the jurisdiction attaches. Yes. Dependency has been established by virtue of the granting of that temporary guardianship. And once that occurs, the minor has until the age of 21 to apply with federal immigration authority. Right, it's a matter of federal. For SIJ, yes. And so the court's jurisdiction to you know, extend the guardianship beyond the age of 18, the court does not have jurisdiction to do that with respect to the guardianship, right? It's exercise of jurisdiction under the probate code is now over, but signing this SIJ order is not exercising that jurisdiction. It is basically informing federal immigration authorities, we did exercise that jurisdiction when this person was a juvenile, which is required under the federal statute. Can, but, the, can, yes. the, can the trial court hold an SIJ hearing after uh, the minor reaches the age of 18? So I don't see any reason why they couldn't, but in this case, it's not necessarily at issue because the court had all of the evidence that it needed. But it didn't rule. I, 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 agree, with, I agree with everything you're saying, <clears throat> but the, the trial court didn't make a ruling within before the age of 18. And the reason the trial court didn't make that ruling was because they were relying on their misapprehension of the dependency right. aspect. Yeah, I, I think we agree with you. Right. So the question is what now? Well, so, so now there's a, there are a few answers. One is that there is no impediment to a Michigan, a, a, the trial court issuing the SIJ findings. The record establishes by, by a preponderance of the evidence, all of the findings that we seek, including dependency, including the non-viability of reunification based on neglect and abandonment. All of those findings have been established by a preponderance of evidence based on the record. But is it then nunc pro tunk or how does that work? Because Judge Cameron's exactly right. Once the child turns 18 and I look all over Michigan law, the minor guardianship can't extend beyond the age of 18. Yes. And that's why the federal statute, which again permits them to apply up to the age of 21, allows for the orders such as the guardianship order that was granted in this case to still be a qualifying order, even when it was terminated based on age. Again, this is in the federal regulations. So, so just to be clear though, yes. the order you seek is a remand order directing the trial court to make the SIJ findings. But we'll all concede that when the court takes the bench and does that, there's no longer a dependency. Yes, the, that, the dependency will have expired based on the child's age. The order, will, the order establishing dependency will have terminated based on the child's age, which again, does not, it would still have no effect on his ability to apply for special- Right, right, right. But, I mean, but doesn't the child turning 18 divest the court of jurisdiction? It divests the court of jurisdiction to take further action with respect to 
appointing a minor guardian. Okay, I, I got that. You, yes. don't, you don't care if the child has a guard, the child's not even a child anymore. You don't care about that. But hey, look, I, I think Judge Cameron and I are hitting on the same fundamental problem. Now that the child's are turned 18, can we order the trial court to make SIJ findings? I would submit to this court that you could make the findings based on the record, uh, and which would follow. <laughs> you can bring it back. What authority in Michigan law does a trial court have to hold this SIJ hearing after the age of 18? They would have the authority to make these, because again, these findings that we're seeking here are not founded in mm -hmm. the court's jurisdiction under the probate code to grant a guardianship and to do the things that they can only do when the child is below the, beneath the age of 18. Here, we're asking the court to sign an order that just basically states what has happened in the case and to, 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 to basically summarize that certain findings were established by a preponderance of the evidence that's in the record here. But as Judge Yates said, is that a nunc pro tunc? I mean, do they backdate it? So that is that, that is at the time given this before he turned 18, I have this ability to do that. So I will nunc pro tunc the order. I would say give, given the somewhat unique posture of this case, in that we're here in front of you now and the child has turned 18 and the evidence was in the record prior to the child turning 18, that would be one option that the court could take if, if, if the court felt that it that it didn't that that, it, that would be a, a a more firm ground on which to stand that is one way that they could approach this but i i don't believe that the court's jurisdiction to issue this order has expired just because the child has turned 18. they can't grant a new guardianship they can't do any of those things but they can issue this order even after the child has turned 18. And I think that this court in its broad general powers and discretion could do the same based on the record that was before the trial court. And importantly, that record was established before the child turned 18. So well, to the extent that there are concerns about that. Well, about that, because the family, the family court has to make the findings. If the court of appeals makes, first of all, we don't make findings, so we're not going to do that. But second of all, to qualify, you have to have a family court make the findings. We're not a family court. Well, so... There is, there is certainly precedent for the Court of Appeals issuing findings in SIJ cases, the matter of Velasquez, which is what the, the case that is principally cited to support much of what we're asking for here. The court did exactly that. The Court of Appeals did exactly that. They issued the SIJ order where the trial court erroneously refused to do so. And there was actually an unpublished case less than a month ago, a matter of BAM-L, um, and that was Court of Appeals case number 36942. Say, say that again. That's the matter of BAM. No, 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 right. what, just a number. Three, oh, six, nine. three, six, nine, four, two, five. And so it's an unpublished case, again, uh, from the Court of Appeals just within the last month. I believe it was June 13th or 14th. The one you just cited? You yes. just gave a site. How can that be unpublished? It had a case nine, number. I, I have copies of it that I could provide to your honors if you'd like. That's, that's okay. Let me just read it back to you. Three, six, nine, four, two, five. That's the docket number. Yes. Oh, that's a docket number. Okay. Yeah, docket okay. number. I'm right. sorry. Yes. And, yes. and you're telling us that yes. that case is similar to this one. So, what, so I'm telling you that in addition to Velasquez, which is already a case where the Court of Appeals exercised its discretion to make the SIJ findings itself rather than remanding to the trial court, matter of BAML, B -A -M -L, the Court of Appeals did the exact same thing, uh, citing Velasquez exercised its own discretion to issue findings that were supported by a preponderance of evidence in the record. I think you're, if you're picking up on the way we're approaching this, your client is incredibly sympathetic. And this is a case where the trial court should have made the findings, but didn't. We just don't want to be lawless. Yeah. And even taking a step further, unlike maybe in, in the previous case, this trial court wanted to look at the best interests, right? They wanted to, not necessary. And it, took too long, but, but I can't say that it was out of ill will uh, that, no. that this delay took place, but it was a delay and it shouldn't have taken place. He probably should have found a different way to get to making a decision early. But that being said, I'm wondering if all it takes is, I understand your argument, correct me if I'm wrong. If a minor in your client's situation is declared 
a dependent, or in this case, it wasn't declared a dependent, it was given a guardian, right? That's what- Yes, and that would trigger. amount to dependency under the federal statute. Right, right. Is given a, no, I'm already, it's been a long day, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I understand, I've is, been here watching. I'm running out of gas. <laughs> uh, is given a guardian, right, as was done in this case. Yes. And then they turn 18, and they're 19, and then they're 20. That 20 year old could go back to the family court for the family court to make a finding and then, and then seek uh, status through the, uh, through the SIG, SIJ. I, I don't see any reason why not, because again, the, the the action that the court is taking is not founded on it, on the jurisdiction that expired with respect to the guardianship, right? It's, it's, a, it's an act that is, I, I won't say independent of that because obviously it is including the fact that the child was made dependent based on an action that was taken by the court when the child was a minor. But I don't see any reason why a trial court could not take testimony if it felt that it needed further uh, to, to, to further the record with respect to this SIJ finding specifically, nothing to do with the guardianship or any of that, because that, uh, under this hypothetical, the child has turned 18. Right. What I'm struggling with is what authority does a family court judge have to hold a hearing relative to an adult, now an adult, to make these findings? Certainly the federal law recognizes that can be done, but there's also states that recognize this through sta a statutory framework that allow for this jurisdiction to continue. I feel like we're between two different places where there's, it's, when it comes to jurisdiction, I get very, I think we all do, get sensitive about what jurisdiction does the court, in this case, the family court, have to address an issue with an adult? So I, I take your point and it, it's it's well taken. and. One of the, again, the, the posture of this case is somewhat unique in that we're not asking the court to supplement the record that was already made here. The court's errors and misapprehensions of the relevant standards and statutes put the, the, the minor in a position of needing to ask this court for its help in resolving those errors. To, but to, to rule with the information it had at the time the kid was a minor. Yes, yeah, so right. we're not what, asking what for if, the here. We're, and there's no suggestion here there was any ill will on behalf of the judge. But what about a situation where there was? You have a judge that says, you know what? I hate these cases, and these people shouldn't be coming in. And I know what I'll do. I'll just sit on this until the kid turns 18, and then boom! I don't, you know, so he's screwed. I, nothing I can do. I mean, isn't that a fear? It's interesting that you asked that question because both matter of Velasquez and the other case matter of BAML that I uh, cited to you earlier. Uh, similar situations arose where in matter of Velasquez, Still the judge, yes, the judge says something like, I'm not going to give the special immigrant status to someone who's come here illegally. And then in matter of BAML, the, the trial court judge felt as though he had sniffed out an immigration scheme, I believe is the way that he put it, um, and refused to even grant the guardianship, let alone hear uh, testimony and, and address the issue of whether he should make the SIJ findings, which then the Court of Appeals later reversed and issued the findings. Um, and the Court of Appeals in that case even granted the guardianship because the judge had refused to do so. Um, so I would submit that based on those cases, this court has a lot of latitude to look at the record below, not supplement, the, not, we're, we're not asking anyone to take testimony and supplement the record below. The record below is what it is and, and our position is that it is, is certainly more than sufficient for those findings to properly be made under the relevant standards. Um, and so nunc pro tunc is, is one way that a court could choose to address that. But based on the record here, our proposed order has been very carefully crafted to reflect the fact that this order that made the child dependent has terminated based on age, but that that does not render it not a qualifying order for the purposes of then applying for special and juvenile status. No questions. No, I learned to keep my mouth shut as much as possible by this time of the day. Because <laughs> I say inevitably, if I say something really outrageously stupid, it's at the end of the day like this. So. It's been an interesting day. It's been fun to watch. All thank right. you very much. Well, thank, thank you. Fascinating case. Uh, matter submitted.
Uh, turning now to a few items that are not endorsed. That's in Ray Esberger Miners 369225. No one is endorsed, therefore the matter is submitted. And then the consolidated case of in Ray Whitney Miner, those case numbers are 369210 and 369222. No one is endorsed, matters are submitted. That concludes first of two days. Peace.